work for the protection of human rights in our country. Thank you. That ends topical question time. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 13107 in the name of Michael Matheson on the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request speak button now? And I call on Michael Matheson to speak to move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 14 minutes. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to open this Stage 1 debate on the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Bill. I'd like to record my thanks to the Justice Committee for their consideration of the Bill and to the many stakeholders who have contributed to that process. The trafficking of human beings and the use of them as commodities for profit is a vile crime affecting the most vulnerable in our society. It is a serious complex and multifaceted crime affecting both children and adults. Whilst human trafficking is an international and cross-border crime, sadly we know it also occurs within Scotland itself. Preventing and tackling the trafficking of human beings in Scotland is a joint responsibility of the Scottish Government, the UK Government, the police, prosecutors, local authorities, support agencies and others. Working together with these agencies on a national and international level, we intend to make Scotland a hostile place for traffickers and those who exploit others, and to better identify and support potential and confirmed victims. We should also be proud that the Scottish Parliament has played an important role in raising awareness and understanding of this crime. The Equal Opportunities Committee of this Parliament published a report into migration and trafficking in December 2010. Subsequently, there have been a number of other reports and publications in this area, including inquiries by the Equality and Human Rights Commission, the Scottish Commissioner for Children and Young People, and Jenny Mara's consultation on her proposed Members' Bill. We are grateful to all of those who have contributed to our understanding of this issue caused by, the, by, this, caused by this heinous crime and its impact on adults and children affected. The Scottish Government, working with other relevant agencies, has taken forward a range of actions in response to these and other reports. We have participated actively in the UK Interdepartmental Ministerial Group on Human Trafficking and also responded to the UK Government review of the National Referral Mechanism for identifying and supporting victims of human trafficking. In 2011, we had our first successful prosecution in Scotland for a specific human trafficking offence. We have also at Seen Police Scotland establish a dedicated National Human Trafficking Unit in April 2013. In addition, the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service now have a dedicated expert, uh, fis expert fiscals to prosecute human trafficking offences. But this is not just about punishing the perpetrators. The victims of these vile crimes need time to recover and to be able to reflect on their experience and that they have the right to expect immediate support and assistance based on their individual need. To facilitate this, the Scottish Government has continued to provide funding to the Trafficking Awareness Raising Alliance, Tara, and to Migrant Help to support adult victims and improve training amongst frontline professionals. We've also provided funding to the Scottish Guardianship Service, who work to support unaccompanied asylum-seeking children, including child victims of trafficking. This bill looks to build on the good work that has already been undertaken. It aims to make Scotland a hostile place for traffickers and to better identify and support potential and confirmed victims. Specifically, the bill includes provisions to clarify and strengthen the law against traffickers and those who exploit individuals, introduce new measures to disrupt and prevent trafficking and those who exploit others, ensure the rights of trafficked victims to access support and assistance, to place a duty on the Lord Advocate to publish guidance about the prosecution of credible trafficked and exploited victims who have committed offences, to ensure a strategic cross-agency approach to tackling 
trafficking and exploitation. Human trafficking is by its nature a hidden crime and it dri it's dri it's driven by a complex nature of issues that can operate across different borders. This bill is an important step in ensuring a strategic Scottish response to this particular issue. However, legislation is only one part of the solution. Therefore, the bill will commit Scottish ministers to publish and, importantly, update regularly a trafficking and exploitation strategy. That strategy will set out a vision and key objectives for a multi-agency approach to tackling human trafficking in Scotland. Actions will include raising awareness and understanding of trafficking, the provision of training for frontline workers who may come into contact with victims of trafficking, and improved data collection and intelligence sharing. Given some of the discussion during the Justice Committee Stage 1 evidence session, I think it's important to be clear from the outset that we recognise that human trafficking and exploitation are crimes that affect both children and adults. The Scottish Government is committed to protecting all children and young people from abuse or neglect. And the trafficking of children, whether within Scotland or internationally, is undoubtedly one of the most heinous acts of child abuse conceivable. Almost all of the provisions within the Bill have equal application to both adults and child victims of trafficking. However, in terms of support, the Scottish Government believes that trafficked children are best supported within the established existing system we have in place to support children in need. GERFEC, our national approach to improving the well-being of children and young people, firmly places the primary responsibility for child victims of trafficking within the child protection framework. We believe that this is the most effective way to support these vulnerable and traumatised young people in their recovery. The necessary support for children, unlike adults, is already set out in GERFIC and enshrined in legislation. This legislative framework means that the necessary provisions for support are already set out in statute. Our intention, therefore, is to address... I'll give way to the member. Jenny Mara. The Cabinet Secretary very much for giving way on that point and to go back to a point we debated in committee, Cabinet Secretary, you said the three existing acts, leg pieces of legislation for children actually provide, but would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that a child that is trafficked into Scotland finds itself exploited does not actually deserve a legal guardian who knows the legal process of getting them through uh, the, the, the trauma that they're in rather than the named person which he seems to prefer, which may be a head teacher or a health worker who's not actually trained in that legal process to see that victim through? Well, there is a number of different routes. There's also the statutory obligation that local authorities have to appoint a child social worker uh, to an individual in those circumstances as well who can help to navigate that particular approach. On the issue of uh, guardianship providing support to an individual in those circumstances, I believe that that's a matter that could be better addressed through the strategy in order to make sure that we have the right measures in place for those individuals as and when it is appropriate. Our intention, President Officer, therefore, is to address any additional support, as I've mentioned, for child victims uh, of trafficking, primarily through the trafficking and exploitation strategy. This strategy will be instrumental in providing a framework to enable us to work more effectively with partners in this crucially important task of appropriately identifying trafficked children. I will now turn to some of the specific proposals within the Bill, with one of the most uh, fundamental is being the proposal to create a single offence of human trafficking, which deals with all relevant forms of exploitation. This underpins much of the Bill. The requirement to criminalise human trafficking is set out in a number of international instruments, including uh, UN protocols and, building on this, the uh, Council of Europe's Convention on Action Against Trafficking, uh, Trafficking in Human Beings and the EU Trafficking Directive. The single offence in the Bill draws on these international definitions, criminalising the arrangement or facilitation of a victim's travel with a view to their exploitation. 
The Bill defines the elements of travel and exploitation broadly to deal with the full range of circumstances in which trafficking or intended trafficking can arise. We believe that this is better than rigidly adopting the EU directive or the UN protocol, as, for example, our proposal does not require prosecutors to prove the means through which an individual was compelled to travel. This will facilitate the prosecution of those engaged in human trafficking. I'm aware that there were some concerns raised in the Stage 1 evidence session regarding the use of travel in the definition. However, it is clear from our proposals that we will criminalise the movement of victims both internationally and within the UK. We are also clear that our proposal will ensure that those who arrange the movement and those who facilitate it, for example, by harbouring or receiving people, will be brought to justice. Our approach to this issue is reflected in legislation recently passed in both Northern Ireland and in England and Wales, ensuring a consistent approach across the UK to this cross-border crime. Another uh, of the issues that was discussed during the evidence session was the matter of a statutory defence for a person who commits an offence as a consequence of their victim status. The Bill currently places a statutory duty on the Lord Advocate to prepare and publish guidelines for prosecutors providing for consideration of the non-prosecution of credible or confirmed victims of trafficking and of the slavery, servitude and forced or compulsory labour offence. During the evidence session and in a subsequent letter, the Lord Advocate expressed concern that a statutory offence, including specific exemptions, could restrict the protection to victims. We remain of the opinion that including a statutory offence in the Bill, which would place a burden on an accused person to demonstrate to the satisfaction of the court that they are a victim of human trafficking would not be an effective tool to protecting victims and that guidelines or indeed instructions from the Lord Advocate better meet the aims of the bill and the needs of victims. Another of the I want to make progress and I'll get a chance to deal with some of these issues in the winding up, no doubt, Ms. Mara. Another of the main issues raised relates to something that is not within the bill. A number of witnesses and respondents to the Justice Committee's call for evidence have suggested that criminalising the purchase of sex should include, be included in the bill. I am conscious that this is an emotive and complex area. Therefore, I have committed to meeting stakeholders both on both sides of the argument and I have already met with some of those since my appearance at the Justice Committee. However, I am also mindful of the views of the committee that they do not believe this is an issue that should be addressed within this specific piece of legislation. Sign officer, the Scottish Government acknowledges and is grateful for the work of the Justice Committee and all those stakeholders who gave evidence or responded to the committee's call for evidence. We are also grateful for all of the work undertaken by many different groups over the last few years, including this Parliament's Equal Opportunities Committee, the Scottish Commissioner for Children and Young People and others who have all raised the awareness and understanding of this heinous crime here in Scotland. I am pleased that the Justice Committee supports the general principles of the Bill and broadly agrees with many of the Bill's proposals. We are also grateful to the Committee for their consideration of the issues and we are actively considering their helpful comments and recommendations that they have made. To conclude, Presiding Officer, we believe this Bill will allow us to better identify and support potential and confirmed victims and ensure that Scotland is a hostile place for traffickers and those who exploit others. Presiding Officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I point out to members that we have a little bit of time in hand, so if you were to take interventions, we will be able to compensate you for that. I call on Christine Graham to speak to, on behalf of the Justice Committee, about 10 minutes. Ms Graham. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Justice Committee as the lead committee considering this bill. At the outset, I too would like to thank all of those who took the time to provide evidence to the committee. 
There is, of course, a full list at Annex A of our report. Let me add that if you are not invited to give oral evidence, all evidence provided from as wide a range as possible is invaluable to the Justice Committee. As well as taking formal evidence, we were also keen to speak informally with victims of trafficking and exploitation, along with the frontline workers who support them. We did this in advance of tackling stage one. We did this by splitting into three groups. The Trafficking Awareness Raising Alliance, Bernard of Scotland and the Scottish Guardianship Service were happy to host our visits and I'd especially like to thank them for giving us an invaluable insight into the issues facing victims, how arrangements are currently working and how they might be improved. I also want to thank the committee, which I'm carrying favour, is a pleasure to chair. That gets me no brownie points from them, I know them too well. But also our clerking team who tried to keep me on the straight and narrow and of course Spice. Recent and unfolding tragedies in the Mediterranean remind us of the desperate measures that people are willing to take to escape situations of fear, war, poverty and violence in their home countries. The committee is keen to keep a close eye on how this issue develops and of course the response to it, although we are aware no amount of legislation will deter the desperate. Human trafficking and exploitation are serious, complex crimes which know no borders. It extends well beyond the sex trade and involves the provision of cheap labour for a number of purposes, all of them exploitative, all of them of people being used as commodities. We know Scotland is not immune to these crimes, but it is clear there are real difficulties in identifying the perpetrators who need to be brought to justice and the vulnerable victims who are in need of real support and protection. Indeed, it was clear from our visits that victims do not always see themselves as trafficked and indeed, someone may start as being an illegal immigrant, but in reality, they are indeed victims of the traffickers. So the issue is very complex indeed. Apart from the recent tragic events, we've become more aware of incidents of human trafficking and exploitation happening closer to home in recent years. Agencies in Scotland reported 55 potential victims of human trafficking in 2013 and 111 in 2014. These are statistics from the National Referral Mechanism. This is, of course, a hidden crime with victims often believing, as I said, they are in a relationship with a trafficker or they're not being trafficked or they fear retaliation against themselves or their families. In Scotland, there's been a lot of excellent work in this area in the last few years from the Parliament's own Equal Opportunities Committee, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, the Children's Commissioner, Jenny Mara's proposal for a member's bill and the Scottish Parliament's cross-party group on human trafficking chaired by Christina McKelvey. We have also seen similar legislation being passed in England and Wales and Northern Ireland. The committee unanimously supports the general principles of this bill and we believe that it will help to identify and bring to justice the perpetrators of trafficking and exploitation, provide better protection and support to victims. We have, however, made a number of recommendations aimed at improving certain aspects of the bill, some of them already addressed in advance and have complained about this before by the Cabinet Secretary. It seems to me, the cart before the horse, we should get to make a report, then you get to comment on it. But there we go. In the time available, I pick out a few highlights. I'll also touch on a number of related policy issues that do not appear in the bill but were raised during evidence. There was broad support among witnesses for the provisions in Section 1 of the bill which creates a single offence of human trafficking for the purposes of all forms of exploitation of adults and children. We heard from a number of witnesses, however, that the definition of the offence should be more closely aligned to international def definitions, and there was a danger that the emphasis in the term travel may not capture adults and children who are moved from city to city or one area to another in this country. We've asked the government to look at this again. I heard what the Cabinet Secretary has said, but sometimes trafficking doesn't even involve any movement whatsoever. So I don't know if the committee will wholly be satisfied with the government's position. It's up to the committee. One area of the bill generating a lot of debate amongst witnesses and committee members is whether the duty being placed on the Lord Advocate to publish guidelines on the prosecution of credible trafficking victims who've committed offences provides adequate protection. Some witnesses argued that a statutory defence for a person committing an offence as a consequence of being a victim should be included in the bill as well as prosecu prosecutorial guidelines. We understand that similar measures on a statutory defence were included in similar legislation in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. 
There were compelling arguments on both sides of the, the case. The Dean of the Faculty of Advocates argued that a statute of defence would provide an additional safeguard for victims, whereas the Lord Advocate was concerned that it would place the onus on a person, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, to demonstrate they are a victim with evidence led before a jury, and argued that guidelines would give more flexibility for prosecutions to be abandoned or for the court to set aside a conviction based on evidence or intelligence at any time. I think it's fair to say that we're to some extent in a quandary as to which was the more convincing case. That's the trouble when you have arguments put forward by the Dean of Faculty on one hand and the Lord Advocate on the other. It's the last one who spoke, had you believing them? In evidence, the Cabinet Secretary confirmed that prosecutorial guidelines and statute of defence are not mutually exclusive. We asked him to consider the position further. You've made your position clear today, Cabinet Secretary. We'll see where that takes us. Anyway, we do welcome the Lord Advocate's intention to publish instructions rather than guidelines to give more weight to the document. The committee also welcomed measures in the bill allowing proceeds of crime legislation to be used against traffickers. It's only right that those who've profited from trafficking and exploiting vulnerable people should have the property and income they gained from this criminal activity confiscated. We agree with the government that this will help towards creating a hostile environment for traffickers to operate in. A general theme arising throughout the evidence was the bill should place greater emphasis on the needs of child victims of trafficking and exploitation. We felt, therefore, there would be significant merit, including a section on the bill relating to child victims. I see that's not met with a positive response from what you've said. It's been a strategy. However, we may put this on. In particular, we were persuaded that more clarity is required to ensure that child victims receive appropriate and consistent support across all areas of Scotland. And we did ask the government to consider whether this should be clearer in the bill or if it should be included in your forthcoming trafficking and exploitation strategy, you've moved to the latter. We support the inclusion of presumption of age clause in the bill, which would mean that a person should be treated as a child to receive immediate access to support and protection if their age is uncertain, but there is reason to believe they are a child. There are people who may pretend to be older than they are for reasons that they think is more secure for them, and many, of course, will not have any paperwork and might not even know their date of birth. Therefore, we are pleased the Scottish Government is considering this issue further. Finally, we received a number of submissions calling for the bill to be amended to include provisions which would criminalise the purchase of sex. There are, of course, others who would strongly disagree with that policy. We did not discuss the substance of the rights and wrongs of that any legislation. Members took the view that this was not the vehicle really to do it in and to do the issue justice. We were struck by evidence from Amnesty International and others who argued that we would do a disservice to victims of trafficking and victims of sexual exploitation and prostitution if the issues were conflated in one piece of legislation. But additionally, we took the view that criminalisation would have implications beyond the matters dealt with in that bill. So we took the view the bill is not the correct vehicle. I stress we did not consider whether or not it was the right thing to do, but whether it could be done within this bill. Uh, and we did took the view that it could not. It was a question of process rather than substance. As a penultimate point, we agree with Scottish ministers, there is a need for training and education to raise awareness to identify and provide support for all victims of trafficking, but in particular children. And I think if one of the things is particular bill will do, it has done that, will continue to do it also through the offices of various members in here who've uh, taken this forward, either Jenny Mara or Christina McKelvey and others. I think we've raised the whole agenda, particularly with regard to exploitation in workplaces, which I think sometimes is seen as a lesser part. I've touched on some of the issues raised in evidence during the committee stage one consideration bill, but I'm sure other committee members will pick up on some of the areas I've not had time to cover. I hope somebody picks up on the, for instance, the national referral mechanism, which I think we could see was flawed. So I hope one of the members will do that. And I look forward to hearing the other contributions in this debate. I now call Elaine Murray. Ms Murray, around about 10 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Act to Abolish Slavery in the United Kingdom was passed in 1883. However, there are around 50 to 100 people each year imported into Scotland to live in a modern form of slavery, people who are constrained and exploited for financial gain by those who traffic them. 
Human trafficking is not human smuggling, though sometimes the word trafficking, uh, trafficking is used to describe smuggling. We have, uh, as others have said, seen appalling scenes re in recent work, weeks, thousands of people drowning while being smuggled into so southern Europe. Some of those people may have been trafficked, but most will not. They are, of course, also victims of unscrupulous criminals making money out of fear and poverty, making money out of those who are fleeing war and persecution. The difference between smuggling and trafficking is that the latter involves the further exploitation in the country or countries to which the victim is brought, whereas the smuggler affects only the legal, illegal en entry into another country. Scottish Labour strongly supports this bill. I congratulate Scottish ministers in bringing it forward. And of course, I also congratulate my colleague Jenny Mara on acting on the need to legislate on this issue and bringing forward her own member's bill in 2013, on which much of this bill is based. Jenny will speak in the open debate and I will be very interested to learn whether she feels that the bill fully addresses the matters she sought to address or whether she believes there are amendments which should be considered and from what she has intervened on, uh, on legal guardianship, I think she possibly feels that further amendment is required. Jane Baxter and I, as Labour members of the Justice Committee, would like to thank the committee clerks, Spice and the witnesses who provided evidence to the committee. Prior to taking formal evidence, we, Roddy Campbell and Graham Ross from Spice, visited the Scottish Guardianship Service run by the Scottish Refugee Council and Aberlour Children Child Care Trust, where we heard from guardians and two young people who had received their services and are now embarking on study and careers in Scotland. Th that visit was extremely useful and very thought-provoking. Similar le legislation has already been passed in the UK and in Northern Ireland, receiving royal assent only earlier this year. So in debating this bill, we are not able to assess the success or otherwise of the implementation of these acts. This bill differs in some respects from those acts, as we've heard. Some of the differences were noted in the committee stage one report and will be discussed this afternoon and I anticipate during consideration of amendments at stage two. The victims of human trafficking are vulnerable for many reasons, which may prevent them from being able to escape their situation. They may trust their trafficker, someone fleeing oppression and persecution in their own land, will have no trust in the agencies of that state. And as Christine Graham said, a trafficked person may not even realise that they have been trafficked. The police, immigration officials, medical professionals, as agents of a foreign state, may be seen, perceived as being much more threatening than the, to the victim than the trafficker whom they know. The trafficker can pay, play upon those fears about what could happen if the authorities get hold of the victim. And the victim may also be concerned about what might happen to their loved ones back home if he or she takes actions which result in the trafficker being prosecuted. There is also every likelihood that the experience of fleeing from oppression in their own country, leaving behind friends and family, unable to contact them, or to know if and how they are surviving. And the victim's subsequent exploitation will cause severe trauma and mental ill health. That is why support for the victims of trafficking is so important, and we welcome its inclusion in this bill. However, we do not feel that the provisions are, as drafted are strong enough, and in particular, we agree with witnesses in the committee that the provision for counselling should be replaced by psychological assessment and treatment. Witnesses to the committee supported the creation of a single offence of human trafficking. The definition of the offence in this bill differs, as we've heard, from that agreed by the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings. Some witnesses, including the STUC and Faculty of Advocates, were concerned that this might mean that Scotland did not fully meet, it, meet its obligations under the Convention. The Cabinet ex ex Secretary explained uh, that and the use uh, to the committee that the use of the European definition could result in that some activities which are currently cl crimes in Scotland being decriminalised, and he has given a different explanation again today. We would like to avoid both possibilities and hope that at stage two, an amendment can be drafted which will align the wording in the bill more closely with our international obligations, but will not decriminalise actions which currently are rightly considered to be crimes in Scotland. We also share the concerns of many witnesses about the dependence in the definition of trafficking on travel. Clearly, the provision and arranging of travel is a key factor in trafficking, but it could be that not everyone involved in the trafficking uh, operation contributes to arranging and or providing transportation. Uh, someone might, for example, only provide the accommodation in which the victim is imprisoned after they have been transported into Scotland and before they are taken elsewhere. Now, listen to what the Cabinet Secretary said about that situation, but if they are not actually involved in any of the facilitation of travel, I would not like to think somebody who is part of the trafficking operation could escape prosecution under the bill because of the, the reference to travel. 
The exploitation of the victims of trafficking takes a number of forms, sexual exploitation and prostitution, forced labour, domestic servitude, the removal of organs and forced criminality such as cultivating cannabis. Police Scotland were concerned that forced criminality might not be covered in Section 3 of the Bill and they and the Lord Advocate pointed out that the issue of so-called consent of the victim to being held in servitude or performing forced labour should not provide a defence for the perpetrator. Now, I understand the Cabinet Secretary does intend to bring forward amendments covering these issues, and we welcome this. There were interesting discussions in committee about whether there should be a statutory defence for victims of trafficking, as Christine Graham has said. No, I was pretty much convinced that there should be until I heard the Lord Advocate's arguments that there should not. He made a persuasive argument regarding prosecu prosecutorial instructions rather than the guidelines that are currently offered in the Bill. I am not yet convinced that statutory defence and prosecutor prosecutorial <laughs> instructions are mutually exclusive. Uh, and as I said earlier, a traffic tra person may not realise that they are a victim of trafficking. Uh, I'm not qualified in law, so I don't actually under know the answer to this potential situation. But what happens if, during the course of a trial, it becomes apparent that the accused is a victim of trafficking? If the Crown Office and Prosecution Service did not know that the accused was a trafficked person prior to bringing the prosecution, they couldn't comply with the Lord Advocate's instructions. A statutory defence could then be applied to the accused. I don't know is this case, if, not, if there was none, the revelation that the accused was trafficked would always mean that the trial would be called off. Uh, as it would not have been brought in the first place if the full facts had been known. And I think that situation we need to explore a, a, a little further at stage two. Men Surely. Graham. A point of fact, I think the Lord Advocate took the view that if it transpired during the course of a trial that the person was a victim of trafficking rather than uh, the accused, that they'd try the case against them would be abandoned. I seem to recall him saying that. Ian Murray. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks for that. It's just a bit of clarity around that, uh, that you know, is an, an issue of concern. Um, many witnesses were concerned about the lack of specific reference to child victims, and we've had reference to this before. The counter-argument is that child victims are already covered by existing legislation protecting children in Scotland, and that specific provision is not necessary. That indeed may be so, but agencies working with trafficked children need to be clear about how this bill will work alongside other legislation. So a section on the support of child victims or some cross-referencing with existing legislation would, we believe, be helpful. We are also sympathetic to the arguments that there should be a presumption of age, which Christine Graham referred to, uh, and, uh, uh, because it is very unlikely that there will actually be actual proof of age for children who have been trafficked. We also believe that the terms young and youth should be removed from the bill, and that a child should be clearly defined, as it is in other legislation, as a person below the age of 18. Finally, there were many representations on something that is not in this bill, but is contained in the legislation re recently passed in Northern Ireland, the criminalisation of the purchase of sex and decriminalisation of its sale. Many Nordic countries already have such legislation and have witnessed a reduction in both prostitution and trafficking for sexual exploitation. As members will know, my colleague Rhoda Grant hoped to introduce a member's bill on this issue, but did not, unfortunately did not receive sufficient cross-party support to have it discussed. Now, it would be possible to amend this bill at stage two to replicate the provisions of the Northern Irish Bill. I think it's quite possible that stage two amendments may be brought forward. And I'm also aware, as the Cabinet Secretary said, that he and the bill team intend uh, and have indeed met with some uh, people with interest in this area, both proponents and opponents of these proposals. Uh, and I look forward to hearing more about the conclusions, uh, his conclusions regarding those discussions when they've taken place. Now, speaking personally on this matter, rather than on behalf of, this, of Scottish Labour, uh, I agree with the principle that men who exploit women should be the offender rather than the women who are exploited. But I do have serious reservations about major changes to legislation being brought in at stage two when they have not been subject to the degree of scrutiny or legislative pro a system provides at stage one. I have indeed criticised the government for introducing major changes at stage two in the past. For example, the original proposals on the, that the provisions of the Prisoner's Control of Release Bill would be introduced to stage two amendments to this Criminal Justice Bill. Uh, nevertheless, I do would welcome the opportunity for further discussion pr provided by possible amendments, although I do say that my preference would be for a standalone bill, as indeed Laura Grant originally proposed. This is a very important uh, subject, uh, and the discussion which took place during the evidence taken by committee have been extremely revealing and interesting. Uh, I look forward to further discussion at stage two. Uh, and I am very pleased to re reiterate Scottish Labour's support for the general principles of the Bill. 
Thank you, Ms Murray. I now call Margaret Mitchell. Up to eight minutes, Ms Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I welcome this Stage 1 debate on Human Trafficking and Explo uh, Exploitation Scotland Bill. As the Convener stated, before taking formal evidence, the committee members split into groups and embarked on three fact-finding visits in February to the Trafficking Awareness Raising Alliance, to Bernardo Scotland Safer Choices Project and to the Scottish Guardianship Service. Gil Patterson, Christian Bernard and I visited Tra Traffic Awareness Raising Alliance, the Trafficking Awareness Raising Alliance, commonly known as TARA, in Glasgow, where we benefited tremendously from the discussion with members of that organisation who have in-depth knowledge and experience of working on the front line with victims. I was also extremely fortunate to have a one-to-one -one meeting with a survivor of trafficking. Her story and the obstacles she had overcome proved invaluable in helping me to understand the complexities surrounding this deeply troubling issue. And I was both immensely impressed and humbled by her courage, determination and optimism for the future despite her horrific experiences. 55 victims of trafficking were reported in Scotland in 2013, and the UK Parliament estimates that there may be as many as 4,000 victims of trafficking today across the United Kingdom. So I pay tribute to Jenny Mara for her not inconsiderable efforts to raise awareness about this issue and to help ensure it is a legislative priority. My thanks also to the Justi Justice Committee clerks, to my fellow committee members and the convener for all their hard work. But it is to all those that gave evidence, including representatives of organisations operating on the front line in tackling trafficking in Scotland, who have made the suggestions that will improve the bill and its provisions. These improvements include looking at the specific language used within the bill, which it was suggested in some circumstances lacked clarity. For example, in section one of the bill, which covers the definition of trafficking, the point has been made that the use of the term travel may imply only international movement, thus failing to take into account the fact that trafficking victims within the UK are moved from city to city. Whilst this view has been disputed by the Lord Advocate, it seems sensible that any perceived ambiguity should be addressed to ensure clarity. I hope, therefore, that the Scottish Government will support the Committee's request to give further consideration to the wording in this section at Stage 2. This will not only help to ensure Scotland's definition complies with internationally accepted definitions, but will also help to ensure there are no potential loopholes in the legislation which could adversely affect prosecutions. In addition to this, many witnesses, including Bernardo Scotland and the Law Society of Scotland, have expressed concern about how the bill deals with children. This is an issue I will comment on in more detail in my closing remarks. For now, I want to concentrate on what I firmly believe to be a crucial issue, namely the provision of a statutory defence for victims. Section 7 of the Bill places a duty on the Lord Advocate to publish guidance about the prosecution of credible trafficking victims who have committed offences. This covers, for example, those involved in cannabis farming. The Lord Advocate has stated and written and in oral evidence that he is willing to consider upgrading the duty to public guidance to a duty to publish instructions on non-prosecution of victims. However, a number of witnesses, including the Faculty of Advocates and Amnesty International, have also called for a statutory defence to be included on the face of the bill, as is the case in the, in the UK's Modern Slavery Act and in Northern Ireland's legislation. In the Lord Advocate's letter to the committee, 
which seeks to clarify his position on this matter, it is far from clear why there simply can't be both instructions for prosecutors as well as a statutory defence for victims. Quite simply, it makes sense to provide a safety net for victims with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service have been unable to find evidence of a credible claim to being a victim of trafficking. As Mr. Yes, certainly. Christian Allard. Mm -hmm. I thank the member for taking an intervention. Would the member maybe accept that they are not mutually uh, uh, exclusive, that you could have both set of instructions and, uh, uh, as well? But it, it will be a matter of procedure. You know, technically, you can have both. But in the spirit, don't you think that that burden on the victims to declare that there is no, there is a connection in between will really uh, could could override uh, that idea that uh, uh, you could have both? Um, to address both points, and as as uh, Christian Bernard has said, um, uh, they aren't mutually exclusive. Allard, sorry, my apologies, Allard. He has a heart. Uh, and in fact, this was a, a point confirmed by Mr O'Neill from the Scottish Refugee Council, who stated we do not see statutory guidance or guidelines which are about prevention and a statutory defence which provides an additional safeguard for individuals when the system, for whatever reason, bro breaks down as being mutually exclusive. We see them as being part of a holistic approach. I also welcome the Cabinet Secretary confirmation that the two are not mutually exclusive and I hope, despite his comments on the subject in his opening speech, that the Scottish Government will reconsider and will bring forward a statutory defence provision at stage two. And to ask, answer specifically uh, Christian Allard's <laughs> uh, point, whilst the provision does place an onus on the victim to prove their status as a victim of trafficking, the crucial point is that a statutory defence would provide an additional safeguard for victims. And I believe that these victims deserve and should be afforded the choice as to whether they want to take advantage of this defence or not. Presiding officer, I look forward to hearing other members' views on this issue and the other provisions in the bill during the course of the debate. Thank you, Mrs Mitchell. We now move to the open debate. Uh, can I remind members that if they wish to take an intervention, uh, we will uh, return the time to you. Can I call Roderick Campbell to be followed by Jenny Mara? Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I refer to my register of interest, a member of the Faculty of Advocates and Amnesty International? Uh, I'm pleased that this issue has remained high on the political agenda in this parliamentary session. From the day in late 2011 at the Hub in Edinburgh, when Baroness Elena Kennedy unveiled the report of the Equality and Human Rights Commission, from the creation of a cross-party group, and from Jenny Mara's bill to where we are now has been a journey. But this bill proves, above all else, that this parliament does indeed take the issue of human trafficking seriously. The committee's evidence sessions were informative, highlighting broad support for these proposals, although raising a number of issues. Turning now to a few of those issues in relation to definitions, there's been concern that Section 1 is not identical to the EU directive, and a particular concern in relation to the use of the word travel, which is not incorporated in the directive itself. Concerns were expressed by many, including James Mulgrew of the Law Society, that travel can be within countries as well as two countries and that the bill should make that explicit. I have to say that I accept there's an argument in the committee. I agree that we ought to ask for this to be considered further, that I am more inclined to the view of the Lord Advocate that the bill does not imply that travel is somehow geographically limited. I'm also happy that the issue of consent not being a defence to the offence of slavery, servitude and forced labour will be addressed at stage two. However, in my view, in order to comply with Article 13.2 of the EU Directive on the question of a presumption of age clause, uh, there is an argument that it ought to be expressly uh, 
provided on the bill. And an argument, I think, was accepted by the Lord Advocate himself when he said it would be helpful to have it within the bill. I'm aware, of course, of the arguments to the contrary of unintended consequences. I simply believe that we should reflect further on this before stage two. On the equally tricky issue of whether a statutory defence should be available to victims of trafficking who are subsequently charged with an offence, or whether we should be content to rely on the Lord Advocate's instructions to prosecutors, a draft of which was produced following the committee's evidence sessions, I would acknowledge that, that, that progress has been made. We are now talking about instructions rather than guidelines. And in my view, they're likely to prove of much more practical ben benefit to victims of trafficking than the statutory defence itself. Whilst it's accepted that a statutory defence is available in other jurisdictions, in particular in England and Wales, there are, as was, came out in evidence, a huge number of offences where it would be excluded. Assistant Chief Constable Graham suggested 130 offences. And the victim will have the hard work required to plead the defence and will also have to satisfy procedural requirements such as fair notice of the defence to the Crown. And, of course, a statutory defence will not impact on situations where an individual trafficked status is only discovered after trial. We heard, of course, as others have mentioned, evidence from both James Wolfe and the Faculty of Advocates that, of course, these two approaches are not mutually exclusive, and, indeed, the Cabinet Secretary himself accepted that. The question is, if we accept that the Lord Advocate's guidelines or, inst or instructions are likely to be more effective, should they preclude a provision for a statutory defence being incorporated in the Bill? What we have to, think, consider at Stage 2 is whether incorporation raises more problems than it solves. On the issue of the sex bias law and whether this should be incorporated in the legislation following the lead in Northern Ireland, I think we have to accept that there is a link between the sex trade and human trafficking. Although human trafficking is far wider than that, indeed a recent court case in Perth, for example, revolved around trafficking for the purposes of a sham marriage. Moreover, the purchase of sex as an issue extends well beyond trafficking. And in addition, we have the practical problem that in contrast to the provisions in the bill in Northern Ireland, where uh, those provisions are in at the start, no such provisions currently exist in the bill. If we were to embark upon incorporating them at stage two, we simply could not do so without embarking on the taking of evidence in a substantial way. Indeed, um, Siobhan uh, Reardon of Amnesty in her evidence uh, to the committee echoed concerns of the Council of Europe's experts that if criminalisation of the purchase of sexual services is to be seen as a measure for reducing demand for sex and therefore reducing sexual, sexual exploitation and human trafficking, there is a need to ensure that measures do not drive the victims of trafficking underground and therefore make them more vulnerable to further exploitation. It's quite clear if we go down this route at stage two, it will be a major piece of work with a consequent impact on the timetable for this bill. However, I am glad that the Cabinet Secretary has, or will meet, representatives of both sides of this argument, including representatives of the churches. I've also met with uh, Feminista recently, and where I do agree strongly with them is that this issue is not going to go away, and it's right and proper that Scotland's Parliament should encourage a debate to take place. <laughs> Presiding officer, this bill contains an important commitment to a human trafficking strategy. We heard from many witnesses on that, and two themes were stressed again and again, prevention and awareness. In terms of awareness, events like the summit hosted in Edinburgh last autumn, with representatives of prosecuting authorities from throughout the British Isles, assist in raising awareness, as indeed do the many organisations operating in the field, such as the Scottish Refugee Council and Tara in particular. But raising awareness of trafficking needs to be tackled by public bodies throughout Scotland, not just by the police, but in particular by employers and those who regulate employment. Prevention is, of course, more problematic. It's also clear that any strategy needs to be kept under review, and I'm glad that the bill provides for the government to be under a legal duty to report to Parliament and to continue to report to them on a regular basis. The support and assistance available to the victims of trafficking under Section 31 will need to be set out further, but finally, Presiding Officer, following the Oppenheim review of the National Referral Mechanism, although not part of the bill, it will be interesting to see how pilots develop elsewhere in the UK and for the Scottish Government to keep under consideration participation in a pilot here. Presiding Officer, this is an important bill, and I wish it well as it proceeds through the Parliament. Many thanks. And I now call on Jenny Mara to be followed by Christina McKelvey. I draw the Chamber's attention to the fact there's a little bit of time available this afternoon to allow you to develop your ideas and take interventions. A generous six minutes. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I am relieved to be standing here today and to speak in Parliament's first consideration of the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Bill. If I wind back to November 2011, when Baroness Helena Kennedy produced her report and inquiry into human trafficking in Scotland, the heinous crime of trafficking did not have the recognition or concern amongst uh, government and public services as it does today. And after reading Baroness Kennedy's report, I became very concerned about the issue of human trafficking but specifically about the knowledge of the crime and the victims and the situation they face in our public services, because we know that as people in our public services, our doctors, our nurses, our police, our prosecutors, who are very likely to come into the first contact with victims and uh, the people responsible for trafficking. In this vein, presiding officer, I wrote to Police Scotland asking to attend their training session as they train police officers in detecting victims and the perpetrators of human trafficking. Six months on from that request, after, after several uh, reassuring phone calls from the police telling me that these training sessions do happen, I was eventually invited to Tully Allen College and travelled down there on a rainy Friday morning and sat in a room with 12 police officers. All of them were men. They were being given what was clearly an introductory lecture to human trafficking. And, presiding officer, when those police officers started to ask questions, I realised that they were our borders police our police officers that stand on passport control in Presswick Airport, at our ports, in all our airports across the country. And these people, these police officers, will often be the first people in contact with potential trafficking victims. Fourteen years on from human trafficking becoming a criminal offence in this country, our borders police were receiving an introductory seminar on the crime of human trafficking. Trafficking has been under the radar for a long time. And that is why it is such a profitable business for criminal gangs and why human rights abuses continue under our noses in this city and in communities right across this country this very day. And that is why the provision in this legislation for a three-year government strategy on human trafficking is particularly important. And I'd like to pick up where Rod Campbell left off. I have been calling in this chamber for a few years now for human trafficking awareness training to be delivered across our public services. Nurses, doctors, social workers, paramedics, all our police and prosecutors should at least have a cursory knowledge of the crime of trafficking and the key indicators to identify a victim. The three yearly strategy in this legislation will allow the Scottish Government to set out a plan for this and will allow this Parliament and the country to scrutinise that action plan and keep coming back to how we are raising awareness and tackling trafficking in our communities. Trafficking is an international and complex crime with massive financial incentives. And I have believed all along that the only way to properly tackle trafficking in Scotland is for all our communities to be on their guard against it so that traffickers know that Scotland is an unwelcome place for their heinous human rights abuses. Presiding officer, it was a Marxist philosopher that said indifference is the dead weight of history. And it is because of this that we must consistently return to this ask ourselves what more we can do. And that is why the three-year strategy is so critical. It is not nearly enough, Cabinet Secretary, for Parliament to... Um, if, if I can make a little bit of progress, I'll take one after. It is not nearly enough for Parliament to pass this legislation this year and wash our hands of it. Human rights are something that must be constantly guarded, protected and examined. And we can see that um, constant threat to human rights as raised at topical questions just today. Presiding officer, on other parts of the bill, on the statutory defence, I share the concerns of some members of the committee that I am not absolutely clear from both what the Lord Advocate said and what the Cabinet Secretary said, that we cannot have both instructions and a statutory defence. Um, it's my understanding that the modern slavery bill in England and Wales have both these protections, both the instructions and a statutory defence. It's also my understanding that the instructions that are currently 
used by our Crown Office in Scotland are the same instructions used by the, the uh, Procurator Fiscal Service, sorry, the uh, Crown Office in England and Wales, and therefore they have these two mechanisms to um, ensure um, that things are working properly. And I would welcome coming back to this at stage two. But moreover, presiding officer, I have concerns around the lack of provision for children in this bill. The presumption of age is something that is included in the European Directive and we have seen in the Modern Slavery Bill in England and Wales. I also have great concerns around the lack of provision for guardianship for child victims of human trafficking. I raised this with the Cabinet Secretary as he opened today's debate. He explained to me in the Justice Committee that he was satisfied that the three existing Children's Acts covered this and that there is no need for legal guardianship for a child who has been trafficked. I dispute this strongly. For a child who has been trafficked into this country and abused, should we not be giving them the legal protection of a trained person with the legal knowledge to safeguard their rights throughout the whole legal and administrative process and help their recovery? Are trained professionals not the least we can do for children who find themselves in this country under the most inhumane and degrading conditions? No. The Cabinet Secretary told me that the named person, a health worker or a head teacher, would be able to perform this task adequately. This is his preferred arrangement. I would suggest to the Cabinet Secretary today that there are already exhausting demands on a named person. And the additional burden of being the legal guardian of a trafficked child should not be added. They are not trained in this role, and COSLA has also raised concerns about funding. Presiding officer, if I have time to take the intervention and conclude, then I will. Chris Joanne Lard's on his feet first. Uh, thanks very much, Jenny Mara, for taking an intervention. What I wanted to make clear is the direction that the member is taking is the direction that the West Minister government is taking is to see that bill only on children trafficking from abroad. Can, can the member reflect maybe on the fact that this bill is about all children, whatever they come from, whatever they are British or they come from another country, and really is to make sure that the legislation is applied to all children who are in Scotland, wherever they come from, whatever their, their identities are. I'll give you another 50 seconds. I would agree with the member presiding officer that all children, whether they are trafficked within the UK or within Scotland or from abroad, deserve the legal protection. But I would say to the member presiding officer that some social workers, head teachers, health workers do not have the legal training necessary to see a child, a vulnerable child, through the complex legal and administrative process that they have to go through um, once they, they have been identified as a trafficking victim. And I would ask the uh, Cabinet Secretary to reflect on that. Presiding officer, I thank the Scottish Government today for adopting Labour's bill on trafficking in Scotland. I believe it is the first human rights bill to be heard by this parliament and I hope we can get provisions right for children in this bill as it passes through at stage two. Thanks so much. Now I call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Alison McInnes. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I, uh, in my opening remarks, uh, pay tribute to the members of the cross-party group um, chaired by myself and Jenny Mara and the work that they have done over many, many years in bringing this to our attention and, uh, and in many, many cases supporting uh, victims of trafficking. Can I also thank the Justice Committee for a very comprehensive report which I managed to get through most of last night um, and, and the summary of the recommendations was an extremely helpful uh, way to uh, navigate um, a very, very detailed report and I thank them very much. Many of the recommendations echo many of my thoughts. So I suppose that, that was a, a, a good thing uh, in my respect. Presiding officer, in, in 1998 I read a report written by UNICEF which suggested that in uh, Côte d'Ivoire that farmers used enslaved children, many from surrounding countries, trafficked into that country um, in the cocoa trade. And then in 2000, the BBC produced a documentary that described child slavery very, very well in commercial cocoa farms in Côte d'Ivoire also. In 2001, the US State Department estimated that there was 15,000 child slaves in the cocoa, cotton and coffee farms in Côte d'Ivoire. 
and the Chocolate Manufacturers Association acknowledge that child's delivery is used in the cocoa harvest. Those three uh, pieces of media, the two reports and the, the BBC documentary, triggered in me a, an interest and a commitment to, to be involved and do as much as I can. And at that time, there was a campaign being run against a very well-known chocolate manufacturer who was using cocoa beans from some of those very uh, farms with those trafficked children. And I have to say that was a successful campaign and they changed uh, how they now uh, uh, gather their, 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 their um, wares for, for chocolate and they now have fair trade chocolate on offer. Um, at that point, uh, presiding officer, I got involved in an organisation called Stop the Traffic, a global organisation that was keen on raising awareness and making a difference. And they certainly have made a difference over the years in many, many areas, including supporting the legislation in California and other parts of the world. When elected in 2007, I decided to use that particular interest to embark on a, a series of tours and talks, which were mainly in church halls and, and community groups across sort of Lanarkshire and, and other areas, um, in, a, a, in a way to, to, to support Stop the Traffic. And one Saturday night in a church in Hamilton, in Castle Parish Church, which sits right in the, the centre of Hamilton, so many people came along to that event that night that we actually did stop the traffic and the police had to be involved. And that gave me real insight into how people understood and wanted to be involved in helping to deal with an issue like this. Because as we know, human trafficking is sadly big business. It's got strong links in, with serious and organised crime. And we in Scotland, I think, are quite rightly focused on getting the right legislation in place. We want to ensure that we have instruct structures to both enhance the status and support the victims and give, as Jenny Mara says, statutory responsibility to relevant agencies as to develop and implement an effective Scottish anti-trafficking strategy. Human trafficking is often linked to forced labour, domestic servitude and prostitution. It's, we know it's an appalling crime and this bill is a welcome step, step in seeking to tackle this profiteering from human misery. That we are focusing on victim support as well as criminal law, I believe, is crucial. It is absolutely right that every support is offered to the people who have been through such horrific experiences. And I've met and spoken to many of them myself. Their stories are horrendous. The committee, I believe, is aware that at present there are shortcomings, and we see that from the recommendations and in the legislation, and these need to be addressed. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's views on that. I did hear him, and I welcome the intentions of the Cabinet Secretary to look at how child protection laws can help children who are trafficked, and trafficked but I do understand some of the shortcomings in that. I am particularly concerned, presiding officer and children caught up in this evil abuse. The Lord Advocate has already appointed a specialist prosecutor to deal with cases involving these abhorrent crimes, but we need to go further to protect the over 20% of children who have been trafficked in Scotland. Children who are trafficked are often sexually exploited and forced into slavery, and the physical and psychological scars can last a lifetime. And I do have to pay tribute to a number of social workers that I knew in Glasgow just a few months before I was elected in 2007. I was working with these social workers who were working with children who were unaccompanied asylum-seeking children, who in many cases had been trafficked. And I pay tribute to the work that they done at the time, and one of our committee members, Carol's Party Group members, uh, was one of those social workers, Jim Laird, who is now uh, very heavily involved in this. Turning to the bill, presiding officer, the bill does need to define what we mean by the child. That might sound obvious, but there is a real danger that children, especially those aged between 16 and 18, slip through the net. So we do need clarity on that provision. And the provisions in the children's hearing system on the welfare of the child also have to ensure that they dovetail with provisions in this bill. Children are more vulnerable to these crimes, and as are those with a mental or physical disability or illness. We need, though, to consider vulnerability in a broader context, uh, context as to ensure that circumstantial issues like ethnicity, 
cultural uh, background, socioeconomic and migrant status. These all need clarification. And the Home Office isn't very helpful at this. So any intergovernmental relationships that the Minister has, the Cabinet Secretary has uh, with the Home Office would be uh, very helpful indeed to ensure that we get some of the clarity we need on this. So it's essential that we tighten the loopholes to provide a clear and seamless protection system right across the age range. Traffic children need to have access to the specialised counselling and support they so desperately need. And this is a bit patchy across um, local authorities. Um, Presiding officer, in conclusion, I uh, support some of the calls from Bernardo Scotland. They have rightly called for the introduction of an independent child trafficking guardian in, uh, on a statutory footing. Uh, this is a key issue for me. As we know, the whole complex and multifaceted problem which respects no borders, it represents a profound violation of an individual's human rights. And I agree with all the uh, comments today. To close, and one of the, at this juncture, providing officer, one of the very grave concerns I've got is any bid to undermine or repeal the Human Rights Act. There's many, many other aspects, but I officers, you, you'll know that I would be interested in. But one thing is the non-prosecution of victims. The Lord Advocate at a recent cross-party group did say that he would put beyond any ambiguity instructions or guidelines, and I look forward to that. This Scottish Parliament has shown the way in many issues over the years, working with Thanks. each other, working with our colleagues at Westminster, our colleagues in the EU. You must we close, make traffickers please. pay and end slavery once and for all. Thank you. Thanks so much. Excellent. Now call on Alison McInnes to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you very much. And, and let me start by praising Jenny Mara uh, for resolutely pursuing this issue and for her private member's bill, which has been the catalyst for this bill. I think it was reported that almost 45,000 people responded to Ms Mara's consultation. Despite that considerable engagement, I think many people in Scotland would still be shocked to learn the extent of this abhorrent crime of trafficking. Accurately estimating the number of victims is understandably difficult, but the figures indicate there are at least hundreds of people trafficked within and into Scotland. People controlled through coercion, low pay, emotional dependence, dislocation or violence. These are appalling, traumatic circumstances in which to live. People might similarly be shocked to learn victims aren't simply confined to sweatshop factories, private sex flats or domestic servitude. They are in more public settings too, hidden in plain sight on farms, in hotels and restaurants. The work of police officers, border officials and social workers has made that bit harder if others can't alert them to potential victims. And clandestine trafficking operations will ruthlessly exploit any trace of ignorance. So this bill will, I hope, provide a, prove, excuse me, a catalyst for change. It presents an opportunity to increase awareness amongst the public and professionals, to strengthen detection and prosecution procedures, and to foster coordination and intelligence sharing between agencies. And of course, to establish an end-to-end -end service for vulnerable victims. I welcome the bill. However, I would go on to highlight some of the issues worthy of further consideration at stage two. I remain open-minded about the introduction of a statutory defence on the face of the bill. The Lord Advocate has outlined compelling reasons why a statutory defence would pose practical difficulties. I would urge all those in favour of its inclusion, including the Faculty of Advocates and Victim Support Scotland, to respond to the evidence we heard recently from the Lord Advocate. But there is some evidence that existing non-statutory guidance isn't preventing victims being criminalised. Aber Lauer draws members' attention to the recent case of two Vietnamese children arrested and held in HMP Pullman following a raid on a cannabis farm. <clears throat> Even after it was ruled they were likely trafficking victims, they were detained for six weeks. Recommendations at paragraph 56 and 57 call on the Cabinet Secretary to consider this further, and I would urge him to do so. One of the most significant omissions in the bill, as currently drafted and as many other members have said, relates to trafficked children. As the committee has observed at length in its report, there is further scope to strengthen the protections for such children. Scotland's Commissioner for Young People and Children, Tam Bailey, went so far as to say the complete absence of children from this bill fails to take into account the vulnerabilities of children and young people as in need of specialist care and support when identified as trafficked, exploited or separated. 
The bill lists an extensive, the extensive assistance adults may require following identification from accommodation to counselling, translation services to medical treatment. And let me pause there and mention that word counselling. On page, paragraph 69 in the committee's report, we recommend that the, the, Minister, the Cabinet Secretary uh, amends the bill at stage two to remove that phrase and replace it with the term psychological assessment and treatment, which much more um, fairly reflects the complexity of the support that is needed. Um, but returning to the bill, it doesn't specify what support child victims are entitled to. The section doesn't even define a child as any person under the age of 18. I listened to the Cabinet Secretary's e explanation this afternoon that these basic facts are sell, uh, set out elsewhere in legislation. However, witnesses have argued strongly that there is merit in reiterating these for the purposes of clarity and to encourage universal compliance, and I support that call. The committee also heard that the absence of a presumption of age clause could compromise the ability of every child to access services. Identifying victims' ages might be hindered by a lack of documentation or because someone has reason to lie about their age. And in this context, if there is doubt or dispute, it seems reasonable to err on the side of caution and assume that an individual is entitled to children's services. I'm also sympathetic to the calls of the Children's Commissioner and Bernardo's for the seriousness of offences involving children to be taken into account in sentencing through a statutory aggravation. And I remain open to persuasion about whether the bill should put guardians for separated children on a statutory footing. We're talking about a substantial number of the most vulnerable children. Aberlour and the Scottish Refugee Council tell us their service has helped guide 60 child victims of trafficking through the asylum process since 2010. Presiding officer, there's been some suggestion that this bill presents an opportunity to criminalise the purchase of sex. Irrespective of members' views, I think the committee rightly concluded that this would not be appropriate. Legislating in this area would require thorough consultation and dedicated evidence sessions. It would be incumbent upon members to look objectively at what works elsewhere and consider how our existing legislation is operating. Surely only a standalone bill could provide the space required for mature, informed discussion to occur. And anything less would do the victims of trafficking and sex workers an injustice. Now, the government has acknowledged again this afternoon that this is a very complex area. And I really actually encourage the Cabinet Secretary today to rule out supporting any attempt to change the law through this particular bill. Presiding officer, Scotland should, of course, project itself domestically and internationally as a country which is neither receptive nor profitable for this callous industry. We really should be a hostile destination. However, it must also embrace and support victims of this most severe of crimes. It isn't always an easy balance, but it's one we must strive to achieve for the sake of those whose rights are violated to such a gross extent. This is an important step towards the adoption of the victim-centred approach to human trafficking advocated by Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights, countless experts and victims' organisations. And Scottish Liberal Democrats will support the bill at decision time today. Many thanks. Now call on Sandra White to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, victims of human trafficking uh, can face horrendous suffering, and there's absolutely no place for it in any society. I just want to touch on some aspects of the bill. I mean, obviously, we know it has six parts. And some of the parts are create a new single offence of human trafficking and a strengthened offence of slavery, servitude and forced labour. Provides for circumstances where the offence is aggravated. Places a duty on the Lord Advocate to publish guidelines on the prosecution of credible trafficking victims who have committed offences. Places a duty on ministers to provide support and assistance to adult victims of trafficking. And one important one is provide for the confiscation of property and the men's proceeds of crime legislation to categorise all trafficking and exploitation offences as lifestyle offences and places a duty on Scottish ministers to produce and keep under review human trafficking strategy. I hope to return to two of these uh, issues, forced labour and the human trafficking strategy, uh, in my um, deliberations uh, shortly, uh, presiding officer. Uh, the extent of trafficking, I just wanted to touch on that particular point as well. The National Re uh, Referral Mechanism report that in 2014, they received 111 referrals of potential victims of trafficking in Scotland, of these, 62-56% were female and 49-44% were male. Of all victims, 
86-77% were adult exploitation categories, and 25-23% were exploitation as a minor. And sexual exploitation is the most common for female and labour exploitation, the highest for adult males. And I think it's important to, to you know, look at these particular uh, figures. Uh, the bill, I think, it is, is very welcome. Uh, I believe it will make, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, Scotland a hostile environment for human traffickers, and it will also help to identify and support the needs of victims. Now, I know that the focus of the bill is very much on the needs of the victims. However, under these proposals, those who seek to continue to peddle the human misery will also face the toughest penalties. Under this proposed bill, for the very first time, this bill will create a new single offence of trafficking for all forms of exploitation for both adults and children, and those who seek to exploit others with a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. I think it's, uh, you know, the bill has got lots of strengths, and I know that the committee had pointed some aspects of it, as had uh, you know, other, people who have, other members who have given uh, their contribution today. But I think it's a real step forward for us, presiding officer, in this particularly difficult times. Uh, presiding officer, I mentioned previously the national uh, referral mechanism and the number of referrals they had received, which shows that sexual exploitation is the most common for females and that labour exploitation was the highest for males. And I think, as I said previously, these are important facts. And uh, that's why I take on board what the Cabinet Secretary and indeed the committee and Elaine Murray uh, also uh, has mentioned in regards to the cr criminalisation of the purchase of sex. Uh, having been at the meetings with Rhoda Grant and went through uh, various um, consultations and spoke to various workers with uh, Rhoda Grant and various groups and also attended the meeting with the Northern Ireland um, uh, uh, minister that came along. I, ha I had a good listen to that and I spoke to the various groups as well and I think I really do agree with Elaine Murray and others that I don't think this bill is the correct piece of legislation uh, to go th put this forward. And I would tend to agree, and I think Rhoda had mentioned this specifically earlier, uh, not today, but uh, uh, when we were speaking about it, that a standalone piece of legislation would be the best way to put forward for this, this bill. I think it would be the most appropriate way to go forward. And the reason I say that, and I'll go on further to that, is the reason I, I picked up on these um, figures, which it does show that sexual exploitation is greater in women, but there are other parts of this trafficking bill which actually touches on male forced labour, as women forced labour as well. So I don't think it's a proper vehicle, and I would certainly be supportive of a standalone bill to go forward for the criminalisation of, of prostitution. Now, I want to return, as I said, to part one of the bill, which is forced labour, and part two of the bill, which is a trafficking strategy, which I was going to raise with Jerry Mara, but certainly perhaps uh, the cab sec can answer some of the questions uh, when, when he's summing up. Alice McInnes actually mentioned this part of it uh, in regarding people who are living in, in absolute fear. Uh, I think all of us here possibly have got constituents who have came to see us concerned about people, perhaps neighbours, shops, whatever it may be that's round about them. I certainly know I have and, and certainly have cases that unfortunately are still ongoing. These people are, are lured to our country. They're lured with the, the thought that they're going to get a good job. It could be in any form of, uh, not, not in the sex industry, but perhaps in restaurants, hotels, whatever it may be. I mean, they land here and they go through sometimes what they think is a proper agency. When they land here, their passports are taken off them. Their passports are taken off them. They're working for absolute next to nothing and they're forced to live in horrendous conditions, overcrowding. When they complain, they are actually threatened with violence and they're moved to another part of the country. Now, that to me is absolutely you know, it's horrific. These people came here to get air money to perhaps send back to their families. Most times it is to send back to their families and yet they're, they're trapped in this poverty and this horrific trafficking of forced labour. And that's something I think this bill you know, does cover and I just want to hope that it's strengthened in some way as well. And the other issue I wanted to pick up and hopefully it will strengthen that part of it, of the forced labour, is the trafficking strategy, which was mentioned by Jenny Mara. Now, Jenny Mara mentioned about social workers, doctors, teachers, named persons, whatever it may be. But I just want to know, in the, the strategy, will it include local authorities, enforcement officers, obviously along with the police, because sometimes local authorities going into premises actually discover 
the horrific conditions that people are working under or living under. So I'd just like maybe a wee bit of clarification on that as well, because we're looking at this <coughs> human trafficking bill in the round, and whilst it's important that we stop the horrific sex trade, equally important to stop the horrific exploitation of people who come over here to try and have a better life for them and their families, and yet they are forced labour into working maybe 12, 14, maybe even more hours a day for next to nothing, no passport whatsoever, and really, they can never get back home again. So I'd just like to get a wee bit of clarification on that. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. And I now call on Rhoda Grant to be followed by Christio Allah. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I very much welcome this Human Trafficking and Exploitation Bill. And can I, like other speakers today, pay tribute to the work of Jenny Mara um, in bringing this issue forward by introducing her own private members' bill to the Parliament. And it's due to her hard work that we now have a government bill at stage one. The work Jenny's done brought this issue to the forefront of the Scottish Parliament and focused our attention on exploitation of the people on our very doorstep and indeed the work of the cross-party group that Jenny's taken place alongside um, Christina McKelvey um, has added to this uh, as well. Most people think of human trafficking as something that happens to people from abroad but in reality it's also people taking advantage of the vulnerable for their own profit very close to home. Human trafficking is not just about moving people through national borders but also about moving people from house to house and from town to town. And we've all heard stories of vulnerable homeless men being exploited for cheap labour and recognise it as human trafficking and exploitation. We also have to think of women and girls used through sexual exploitation as a form of human trafficking. Many women and girls from Scotland are being moved around as we speak. These people are not only held by force, but they're held by their own vulnerability. And our society needs to protect these people. And I welcome this bill's efforts to increase legal protection and ensure support for victims. But more needs to be done to prevent these individuals being exploited in the first place. And therefore, I want to concentrate on what is not in the bill. We have to rem remember that the majority of victims of human trafficking are women and children. And therefore, we have to look at it through the prism of gender inequality. The majority are being trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation, and we need to put measures in place to prevent this, and we need to end demand. I truly believe that the market for prostitution in Scotland leads to people being trafficked to Scotland for sexual exploitation. Equally Safe recognises sexual exploitation and prostitution as violence against women and girls, yet our law penalises the victims of violence against women and girls rather than the perpetrators. Northern Ireland have put through their own Human Trafficking Act and have incorporated the sex buyer law into it, recognising that demands, demand fuels that, this industry. And the sex buyer law decriminalises those who are prostituted. Victims should never be criminalised. It criminalises those who purchase sex acts, but it also invests and in roots out for those who are prost in prostitution and who wish to rebuild their lives. Now that Northern Ireland has done this, and the Irish Republic is very likely to follow suit, it means that Scotland will be seen as a much more welcoming market for those who traffic the vulnerable into prostitution. And we also know that illegal drugs trade and organised crime are very closely linked to people trafficking and therefore we're likely to attract an increase in other forms of criminality into Scotland. That's why I believe that tackling demand for sexual exploitation is a crucial part of this bill. Any delay will make us a target for traffickers. We must act now. Countries that have legalised, um, legislated for the sex buyer law have seen pro the fall in prostitution and indeed a fall in human trafficking. They've also seen a positive impact on tackling inequalities. Women are commanding higher salaries because their society sees them as equal and values them rather than exploiting them. Zero to tolerance tell us in their evidence to committee the legality of paying for sex has also been found to influence the rates of sex trafficking into the country in question. The White Ribbon campaign say sex trafficking underpins 
underpinned by the principles of supply and demand, a majority of men in Scotland currently feel, a minority of men in Scotland currently feel entitled to pay women for sex. The STUC have said demand for the tra trade has been increasing between 1990 and 2000. The number of men paying for sexual acts in the UK almost doubled. Tackling this demand is crucial to reducing and preventing prostitution and trafficking. And they were just some of the, the voices that back this measure. There are many more, and indeed, I could spend my whole speech quoting them. People are being trafficked into our country today for sexual exploitation. We only need to look at Rotherham, where young girls were being trafficked throughout the city for sexual exploitation. Their exploitation didn't stop when they turned 18. You do not need to be foreign to be trafficked and exploited, and the only way to stop it is to end demand. Now, a number of speakers have spoken against uh, raising this in this bill because of the lack of evidence and the lack of consultation. Two parliaments ago, the Justice Committee took evidence on this under the Criminal Justice and Licensing, which is now an Act 2010, when Trish Godman tried to amend it. Trish Godman then followed up with a consultation in her own right. She then retired. In the last parliament, I consulted on the same subject. This, this subject has been consulted to death. We've seen the evidence, we know the evidence, and therefore I think it's really important um, that it brings forward it's brought forward now. I did attempt to bring forward a standalone bill, and indeed my preferred option would have been that that bill had become law, but I didn't receive the backing of the Parliament. Therefore, I wonder how many more Parliaments we need to pass before we make this law. There are those who say that prostitution is a choice, and I'd have to admit, like everybody else, there was a time I believed that to be the case too. But I ask people to think about it a bit more deeply. Would it be okay for you to sell sex? What would make that fine? Your poverty, escaping domestic abuse, what else? Because these are the drivers. And if you still believe it's a choice, imagine it were you, imagine it were your sister, your mother, your daughter, or your wife. Would that still be okay? I don't believe that anyone who sees the reality of prostitution thinks it's okay to exploit another human being for their own power and pleasure. We need to implement the sex buyer law. By doing that, we build a more equal and safe society. And we also create a society that's unwelcoming to traffickers. Many thanks. I now call on Christian Allard to be followed by Jane Baxter. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And I'll thank Lord Agron for a contribution, even if I do not agree, like other members, that should, that should be involved in this bill. I, I, I do agree with a lot of things what she's saying, and particularly when Rodra Grant said you don't need to be foreigner to be trafficked. And that's one of the most important things that I was trying to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to put into this debate in my interruptions. It's very, very important to understand how wide is, how wide is, is this bill, and it's very important to keep that bill as wide as possible and to reflect on the spirit of the bill and what uh, type of of bill we are having in front of us. I thank the committee members for all uh, the good work we did together uh, to, to draft this report and the, the uh, convener of the committee, of course, and of course all of the organizations and the individuals who came to give evidence. Some of them, we went to see them, and I would like to uh, maybe single out the contribution of uh, trafficking awareness, raising ILA and STARA in Glasgow, who's doing just a fantastic work. And like uh, Margaret Mitchell, I had uh, the privilege to meet uh, one of the victims. And uh, it, it, was, um, it, it was really challenging. It was very challenging for me uh, to hear uh, her experience. But I think it was more challenging maybe for her to share this experience with me. And it's where you really realize that uh, this bill uh, as, uh, will make a big difference and has to make uh, a very big difference. Uh, the committee uh, supports the, principle, the general principles of the bill, and, and so, so do I. Um, treating people as people is what's the most important thing about this bill, whatever they are children, whatever they are adults, and whatever they come from or their nationalities. Um, it's, 
and whatever language we speak as well, because it's true that a lot of them speak different language. Uh, whatever we understand as well, what has happened to them or not, uh, we, we came uh, to the conclusion that consent uh, sh shouldn't be involved, of course. Uh, the principle of consent uh, has got nothing to do with the ability. So a lot of the victims uh, think that we have given consent, and Police Scotland give us a very good insight uh, that consent shouldn't be seen as an excuse. Uh, we have a duty to look after them uh, because uh, they are us, uh, because uh, we can be British, because uh, uh, we can be part of our families, uh, we can be our neighbours, and be just like us, it's, it's, it's who they are. And all forms of exploitation for adult children, uh, we talked about the vulnerable, are vulnerable. Uh, they attack particularly the traffickers particularly attacks the vulnerable people. And vulnerable people are not always children. You know, there are uh, vulnerable people in adults as well, and we meet, met some of them. And traffickers are, are trying to target uh, adults with learning uh, difficulties, for example. So uh, that duty to provide needs for vulnerable children exists already in Children's Scotland Act 1995, like the Cabinet Secretary uh, said. And it's quite important to realize that, again, not to separate them and us, and realizing the wide uh, uh, remit of his bill that uh, we, we care for everybody just like we care for, for, for ourselves. And I think the idea uh, to, uh, to, uh, to keep it the way it is and making sure we don't do extra provision for children thinking that we've been uh, uh, exploited and trafficked. But the idea is behind it is if, if we change the bill, the spirit of the bill will, will mean that they are not like us, we are uh, people who've been coming from other countries, and we heard a lot of m m members talking about that. I really want that bill uh, to, uh, to be applying for everybody, uh, for, for, for whatever they come from, and, and not to, to forget about all the vulnerable uh, others we heard, we, we heard about. Uh, another point, it's... Um, the burden uh, put on victim, uh, I, I think it's very important, uh, the point that Margaret Mitchell made, a statutory difference for trafficking victim who have uh, committed uh, offence could really uh, uh, be a problem uh, for, for, for most of the cases because uh, if, even if we can, have, we, we can have both, at the end of the day, uh, the, the, at, at, at the point of, of coming in front of a court, the, the, the victim will, will more than likely be asked uh, to try to, uh, to justify uh, that uh, uh, it's the, the fact that she or he was trafficked. Uh, was 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 a, a defence, and and of course the statutory defence uh, will 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 become could become a, a, a burden, and. I, I like the idea of the Lord Advocate to give a commitment to, to introduce the instructions rather than guidance. And I think that, that, that's good enough for me, particularly that we can add a lot of more uh, in, the, in the strategy. In the strategy which, which we'll get, the strategy we'll get, we'll get afterwards and which will be updated, of course. Uh, another big problem I think we didn't talk about in this debate is the national referral mechanism. This, again, is talking about the spirit of this bill, and we've got a different spirit uh, regarding the national referring mechanism. Uh, I can't see, I'm, I'm quite pessimistic about it. I can't see a UK-wide anti-slavery commissioner, for example, changing the attitude of the Westminster, past Westminster governments towards victims of trafficking and exploitation. The, and I am the national referral mechanism is really, really targeting people coming from abroad. It's really, really very narrow-minded. And when you think about it, it's not really on the side of the asylum seekers. And I, I do find that having all our, our legislation based on the NIM caused me some problem. And I know that uh, there were a review, and I know there's going to be some pilots uh, ha happening down south. Unfortunately, with the change of uh, Westminster government, I'm, I'm, I'm still not so sure that uh, uh, it, it, it should be as, as good as, as it could be. And I do agree with Amnesty uh, International and their statement when we talked about the national referent uh, mechanism, but it should be devolved. Uh, I won't quote uh, the, the briefing, but, but you can read them. And I do agree that if after the pilots, and the Cabinet Secretary maybe will reflect on that, is after the pilots we see that it's not fit for purpose, like we heard from a lot of people, it's maybe, maybe a good idea 
to think about how we having your own and having it devolved and maybe having as well our own uh, anti-slavery co you commission. Close, please? Uh, I would like to give the benefit of the doubt, as I say, to the Westminster government and, and the new MPs about it, but we, we really ought to think about it. In concluding, uh, going after traffickers and exporters using people as slaves has to be a priority for both government at UK level and at Scottish level. And I do welcome the recent U-turn of the Westminster policy on rescuing victims of trafficking stranded in the Mediterranean Sea. And that's very welcome. But I would welcome a similar U-turn on the spirit of the Westminster policy regarding the national reform uh, mechanism. Very close, and uh, this bill is to put in place measures to better identify and support the needs of victims. Putting victims at the centre of this bill is recognizing that here in Scotland, victims of trafficking and exploitation will be heard, helped and cared for. Presenting officer. Thanks very much. Now call on Jane Baxter to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Mm. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, since I became elected to the Scottish Parliament at the end of 2012, I have been involved in several pieces of legislation, each of them very important for the various interest groups and stakeholders concerned with whatever was the issue. When I learned I was to be involved in this piece of legislation, I had a deep sense of being given the chance to make a difference for some of the most vulnerable people you could ever imagine. And whilst the challenges we face are global and complex, we must not allow that to stop us from doing the best job we can as a country and as a parliament to make life fairer and better for victims and much harder for the perpetrators. Human trafficking is a blight, not, not just on Scottish society, but in every other part of the world. I'm pleased that there's an established and growing consensus internationally that governments must take strong action to deal with the root causes of human trafficking and its effects. Let me firstly acknowledge the work of my colleague, Jenny Mara, MSP, on this topic. Her private member's bill was clearly a landmark in the development of a Scottish approach to, to tackling human trafficking. It sought to create a Scottish anti-human trafficking strategy, provide for the special treatment of human trafficking related crime within the criminal justice system, and provide support for the survivors of human trafficking. These are positive provisions that we should be grateful to her for bringing forward. Human trafficking is a crime against some of the most vulnerable people on the planet. Migrant help, an organisation with a stellar reputation for assisting the most vulnerable, said of human trafficking that, in general, victims are often selected as prey because they are already in a marginalised or vulnerable part of their original community. Examples are those in poverty, those from a particular ethnic or cultural subset, those who are already badly treated, those with substance misuse issues, those with learning disabilities or mental health issues, those with low self-esteem, and those females from countries where women are traditionally, culturally and institutionally abused. These groups have no voice in society. They often cannot speak English. They are marginalised and ignored. It is surely incumbent upon us to ensure that they are protected. The most recent statistics show that over 100 people were identified in 2014 as potential victims of human trafficking. It is unquestionable that the actual number is significantly higher than this. The majority of those who are trafficked are victims of sexual exploitation. Often they are trafficked in order to be forced into sex work. Their ordeals can continue for years and their suffering unimaginable. The crime, therefore, is a very serious one. For this reason, the increase in the severity of punishment for human trafficking is welcome. Whilst 14 years was a strong punishment, the introduction of a maximum life sentence for those convicted of human trafficking in Scotland sends out a clear signal. Scotland regards human trafficking as amongst the most serious crime that can be committed. Too often the punishments doled out by the courts for those convicted of human trafficking have been nowhere near the 14-year maximum. Some have been best measured in months. That is clearly not good enough. A key provision in the bill is the strengthening of the current slavery, servitude and forced labour offence by allowing the court to consider in assessing whether a person has been a victim of an offence, the victim's characteristics, such as age, physical or mental illness, disability or family relationships. This contextual information, along with the use of explicit aggravations, will allow courts to take account of the clear aggravations of trafficking of the most vulnerable human beings. The bill will place statutory duties on prosecutors and the police regarding human trafficking. The specialist work committed committed to by Police Scotland and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is important. This work must be monitored and improved upon constantly if we are to have the strongest possible framework for dealing with human trafficking. The creation of a single offence, 
which encompasses the entirety of human trafficking and exploitation, is welcome. The Justice Committee will have to work hard to ensure that Section 1 of the Bill is a robust and well-defined provision. The Justice Committee will also have to scrutinise the remainder of the legislation closely to ensure that it takes account of the full range of activities surrounding human trafficking. The exploitation of adults and children in this context is wide-ranging. This legislation must be able to take into account the breadth of experience of those who have been trafficked and punish the perpetrators properly. It is important that we ensure that our approach to human trafficking takes into account Scotland's distinctive approaches to many aspects of criminal justice policy. The Equality and Human Rights Commission is surely correct to identify our legal and policy framework for adults at risk of harm and our long-established gender analysis of violence against women as distinctive aspects of Scotland's criminal justice system that must be accounted for even when adhering to international obligations. Throughout the remaining stages of this Bill's passage, this Parliament must work hard to ensure that these distinctive approaches are incorporated into the Bill and that we do not apply an international one-size-fits-all approach to this problem. I believe that this is a view that we will all share. To summarise, this Bill is one that ought to be supported at this first stage. The overall strategy appears to be a good one. The Bill is clearly in need of refinement and it is important that we listen closely to victims' groups, the criminal justice community and academic experts in the field to refine and perfect the Bill. It is also important that we do not complacently believe that we can simply pass a piece of legislation on this or any other topic and solve the problem. We must monitor closely what the consequences of this legislation are and work hard to make sure that our strategic approach is best suited to Scotland. Victims must be at the heart of what we do when we face up to the problems of human trafficking. We must not let them down. Thank you. Many thanks. Now call on John McAlpine to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, Presiding <coughs> Officer. I too am delighted to speak in support of this legislation, which is another example of this Parliament's excellent record of protecting the most vulnerable. Uh, those who perpetrate this crime should face the toughest possible penalties, and the victims deserve as much support as we can give them, and this bill, bill seeks to do both, as well as, importantly, raising awareness of the crime, ensuring that we are all properly informed uh, about it and equipped to detect it in the first place. Um, trafficking, as others have mentioned, covers different forms of exploitation and I want to focus today on, as Rhoda Grant has already done, on prostitution, which is um, a very significant form of exploitation that it addresses. Uh, I'm fully in agreement with the comments made by Rhoda Grant um, and the calls of a number of organisations, important and respected organisations, who have pointed to the, to the link between trafficking and prostitution, which is so strong um, that we need to end demand if we are to remove the incentive which drives the criminals who seek to profit from the sexual exploitation of other human beings. The Scottish Government includes prostitution in its own definition of violence against women, and that is quite correct, as, as Rhoda Grant uh, quite eloquently pointed out. Many, many people in the past sincerely believed that uh, prostitution was a free choice, but the more you actually look into it and read um, of the experiences of, uh, of people who have been through this, it's, it's very, very clear that the vast majority of people and women involved in prostitution are driven um, by factors such as, uh, as poverty and, and abuse in childhood and exploitation. Uh, I welcome the Minister's comments that he's meeting those groups who have views on this matter and leaving the door perhaps slightly ajar uh, for amendments at stage two. Um, that would put us in the same place as Northern Ireland, whose anti-trafficking legislation has been widely praised in this debate today. And I went, too went along to the... Yes, I will. I'm grateful for the member taking intervention. I wonder whether the member cared to comment on Amnesty's view, expressed by uh, at least one member already, that you'd be doing neither subject justice by conflating them in this one bill, particularly when the evidence hasn't been taken by the committee. John McAlpine. Well, I, I attended the, um, the event in Parliament with those who, um, who advanced this legislation in Northern Ireland, and I noted that the arguments uh, that are put, put here today, um, and which um, Mr Finney's raised, were also raised in, in Northern Ireland. And after examining all the evidence, the different political parties in Northern Ireland came together to pass the clause and did not feel that it damaged the rest of their bill. And I think that anything that brings together the Democratic Unionist Party and, and, and Sinn Féin obviously has a lot of robust evidence that, 
that command, commanded its support. Um, I've, um, I welcome the committee's report and I note that it didn't take a great deal of oral evidence on ending demand. However, I also note paragraph 136 of the report, which pointed out that several very respected organisations offered written evidence in the matter and uh, they included Community Safety Glasgow, which includes Tara, and which pointed out to the very clear links between trafficking and the sex industry and offered the committee to, to advance more evidence um, uh, backing up that, that written evidence if, if it was interested. Um, as Rhoda Grant's already said, if we fail to follow the lead of Northern Ireland, which will soon uh, be followed by the Republic uh, to end demand, Scotland could become a soft touch for criminals profiting from the sexual exploitation of others. Uh, I mentioned that the written evidence to the committee uh, was uh, compiled by very respected organisations, and those include the STUC. And I think it's worth um, quoting from the F STUC's uh, written evidence um, at some length. It says, commercial sexual exploitation is a growing problem in Scotland and the UK. The trafficking of women and girls into prostitution in England and Wales is worth at least £130 million annually, uh, while it's estimated that 80,000 people in the UK, mainly women and girls, are involved in prostitution. And it goes on to say that demand has been increasing between 1990 and 2000. The number of men paying for sex acts in the UK almost double. And it also quotes from... Uh, a speaker at uh, Unite's uh, conference uh, on th this, this matter, a speaker from Survivors Network, who said, without punters, there would be no prostitutes. Without prostitutes, there'd be no trafficking. And that the SUC therefore called for the trafficking bill to contain a provision for the criminalisation of the purchase of sex. And I, I quote extensively from the SUC um, to underline that this isn't, um, while I know that the churches have advanced uh, evidence on this in supporting ending demand, this, this has come from a secular organisation which is committed to social justice. And uh, uh, while I respect the views of the churches, I'm not coming at this from a religious point of view. I'm commit, committing, coming uh, to this from a feminist point of view and from a, a social justice point of view. Um, we only have to look at Norway and Sweden and the evidence that's uh, been advanced there after they brought in laws to end demand. Um, and if I could turn to Sweden first, uh, Simon Hagstrom, the detective inspector at the prostitution unit of Stockholm Police, has reported that uh, the number of men paying for sex in Sweden has declined since the sex buyer law was adopted. And between 1996 and 2008, the proportion of men who reported paying for sex declined from 12.7% um, to 7.6%. I think that, that's very significant because um, the, the other um, evidence that was brought forward um, to, to the committee uh, uh, in written evidence showed uh, that there is considerable evidence that uh, men who uh, pay for sex are more tolerant of things like uh, rape and uh, um, other forms of violence against women. Um, also in the evidence from, from Sweden, street prostitution had halved in the period 1999 to 2008, and there was absolutely no evidence that women were similarly displaced to indoor prostitution or prostitution ad advertised online. And to address some of the comments uh, that these kind of laws uh, push please. prostitution underground, uh, I would just go back to the evidence in Northern Ireland and that the punters can find these sex lines, the punter can, can go on Online and use these internet sites, so it really sh could, shouldn't be on the ken of the rest of us to manage to track down the criminals who are exploiting women in this way. And while I totally respect the views of others who have, have expressed concern about this, I do think that if people sit down and read the evidence that they will come to the same conclusion as close, me, please. that if we, want to end, uh, if we want to end trafficking, we have to end demand. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. I'll call on Malcolm Chisholm. To be followed by Gil Pers. Um, uh, Presiding Officer, I would start by recognising the excellent report uh, provided by the committee uh, on this, but also pay tribute to the trailblazing work of Jenny Mara on this issue, who we all know introduced her member's bill, which had such a massive response uh, in the public, uh, to the public uh, consultation. I know everybody in the chamber will find trafficking a horrendous crime and welcome the uh, objectives of the bill to consolidate and strengthen the law and provide the best possible protection. Uh, vulnerability is a salient feature, uh, as the report reminds us, in all instances of trafficking, since the victims um, uh, are subject to violence and control uh, and exploitation. 
And I think we would all agree that children are the most vulnerable of all. And I think, uh, as uh, various speakers have emphasised, uh, the bill is uh, a bit weak in relation uh, to children because it lacks uh, special provision for them. And I'm sure this will be a major feature uh, of uh, discussion uh, in uh, committee. For example, uh, in um, section 5, in terms of uh, statutory uh, aggravation, when there's a trafficking background, has been widely welcomed. But Bernardo's and others also uh, stress that there ought to be uh, a, an aggravation uh, when it came to the uh, vulnerability of child victims, and I hope that is something that will be uh, considered at subsequent stages. Others have mentioned the, the need to define a child as someone uh, under 18, uh, to have a presumption of age clause, and also to ensure that there is a, a guardian uh, of uh, child victims uh, on a statutory footing, and I think that's something that is actually required by the EU uh, directive. Uh, finally, in relation to children, there is no specific uh, support um, uh, and assistance for child uh, victims. There is, of course, uh, a general duty to provide support and assistance, which, which we all uh, welcome. But again, in relation to that, which is such a, a central part of the bill, there are important amendments that need to be made uh, at stage two. Uh, for example, there is a reference to counselling, but that is far too weak and inadequate in relation to the trauma that most uh, victims of trafficking have suffered. And I think the suggestion uh, of that being replaced by psychological assessment and a treatment is absolutely uh, right. There are various other issues in relation to uh, uh, support and uh, uh, assistance. For example, the time issue. Uh, it's been pointed out that there is no uh, minimum time for support and assistance in the bill. Uh, and uh, 45 days reflection and recovery period is, is, is normal now. So that, uh, or, or, or hopefully something more than that, should, I believe, be made explicit in the bill. And there's also the kind of debate that we often find between the word may and the word must in relation to Clause uh, 8, Section 3. And I hope, again, some of that can be strengthened so that the best possible uh, support and assistance is given to the victims uh, of traf trafficking. Finally, in relation uh, to... To that, Tara asked whether access to support and assistance uh, would uh, depend on access to the national referral mechanism, and perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could uh, answer that uh, question in his response, which leads me on, of course, to the national referral mechanism, which uh, I first came across soon after it was set up, because I was on the Equal Opportunities Committee that uh, looked at this issue uh, four or five years Ago. And this is not an issue that has come up in the debate today, but when we took evidence on it, there was concern that the immigration status uh, of any a referral to, appeared to be a key factor in deciding whether the person was found to be a credible victim of trafficking. I thought Christina McKelvey might talk about this because she certainly has in the past. But, for example, when I was on that committee four or five years ago, we heard that in the first year of the um, uh, national referral mechanism. 76% of UK nationals referred to the mechanism were officially recognised as being trafficked. In stark contrast, only 29% of non-British EU nationals and a mere 12% of third country nationals were officially recognised as being trafficked. So I don't know if that is still uh, such a big issue. See, clearly the mechanism has moved on. There's been a review which has been generally welcomed and I think most people accept the, 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 the conclusion of the review that we should move away from a centralised decision-making process to regional panels, um, which I think should be multidisciplinary and multi-agency. So I think uh, events have moved on, but there, are still in the, uh, there is still in the evidence uh, a lot of concern about the way that the national referral mechanism has uh, operated in other ways. For example, Victim Support Scotland pointed out that there is too much emphasis on credibility uh, and suggests that this uh, approach would not be applied to other, uh, uh, um, other, uh, others coming forward with claims of abuse. And further to that, Bernardo of Scotland stated that the welfare of vulnerable children, going back to that, would perhaps be better protected by allowing processes uh, um, to take place with child protection teams rather than through the NRM. So lots of issues there, but I think we all recognise there has been progress uh, on that. Now, Christina McKelvey, uh, not Christina McKelvey, sorry, Joe McAlvin gave a very powerful speech, as did Rhoda Grant. Uh, in, ter in relation to the, the controversial issue uh, of, of, of demand 
uh, for prostitution, but I don't think anyone can deny that there is a strong link between the sex trade and human trafficking, and I believe that we do have to see this issue through a gender inequality prism uh, and uh, tackle demand, uh, as many witnesses such as Tara and the SGC uh, emphasise. Now, um, I would also support, and I think this is important, what Jenny Mara said about the importance of the three-year uh, government uh, strategy. That is required by the legislation, and that uh, is a very important part uh, of it. Uh, and she highlighted, uh, again, the particular importance of awareness raising and training for frontline staff. I think that is a key uh, issue in terms of uh, identifying those who may be the victims uh, of trafficking. I think my time is almost up. There are lots of other uh, details which I think have been covered in the debate which will come up subsequently. I was particularly interested in debates around the definition and to what extent uh, our definition should be the same as the EU uh, directive. And there was, uh, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, disagreement, I suppose, about whether there should be a statutory defence, but it seems to me that there, there ought to be that in addition to the guidelines. And also I noted the, the concerns about the... Uh, the word travel, um, and again, I recognise those concerns. So I think uh, my time place, is please. up. I look forward to uh, the uh, subsequent stages of the bill, but congratulate uh, the committee on its report, the government, for bringing forward uh, the legislation, and Jenny Mara for setting the ball rolling. Many thanks. Now call on Gil Patterson to be followed by John Penney. Thanks no very much, Presiding Officer. Up to seven officer. minutes. Thanks, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to speak in this debate as a member of the Justice Committee on what is such an important issue. There can be nothing lower in humankind than when attempting to make your life better by moving to another country, you find that the people you have placed your trust in and to assist you turn out to be involved in the criminal activity of human trafficking. Trafficked to a destination where you are cut off from that society due to the ethnic groupings and facing language barriers as well as the fear of violence both to yourself and perhaps to your loved ones in another country. Facing the realisation that this has happened because you have been tricked and can expect to have a future of slavery or worse, being forced into prostitution when all you wanted to do is better yourself is something which to me is unimaginable. So if this bill helps just one person, adult or child, male or female, to escape this life of being in hell, then it's worth working on by all our parliamentarians to ensure it is the very best of work that we can do. I would like to focus on a few of the issues within the bill, however, and I should say I agree very much of what is contained within the committee report. Firstly, during the evidence session uh, taking, uh, I carefully listened to the Lord Advocate's case on statutory defence and found his arguments entirely persuasive. The Lord Advocate explained that a statutory defence would require the potential trafficked person to retell and provide evidence of being trafficked before a case can be progressed. Notwithstanding the circumstances that, that we are in, which would be dealing with strangers and officialdom, Having to produce evidence in a restricted time would add serious pressure to someone who is in the process of recovering from such a traumatic experience. Whereas, if the case could go forward on the suspicion of a person being trafficked, the evidence may materialise during the investigation of the perceived crime in an all-encompassing way. This is what was envisaged by the Lord Advocate, and I believe that this would be the most robust approach to follow. Certainly. Margaret Mitchell. I, I wonder if he accepts it isn't an either or, that you could have the uh, instructions from the Lord Advocate and give the victims the choice of having um, a statutory uh, defence if they chose to use it. I actually thank uh, Margaret Mitchell for that intervention. I'll just come on to that uh, very point, uh, uh, Margaret. Uh, since it, it could be the case that if a person was a victim of trafficking but could not provide evidence from the outset, then an injustice will have taken place simply because of a statutory right to defence, which completely undermines what it is intended to do in the first place. However, and this comes to the point that you raised with me, Margaret, 
However, I, I note that the Cabinet Secretary has confirmed that the instructions as suggested by the Lord Advocate uh, and uh, statutory defence are not mutually exclusive. Therefore, I will wait until the final outcome before concluding my own views on the matter. I would like to turn to, uh, and, and turn to make a comment on the calls from some quarters to include the criminalisation of purchases of sex in the Bill. And I think it is fair to say that the Committee was reluctant at this stage to include this measure into the Bill. This was because the Committee, firstly, had not taken any evidence on the matter, and secondly, that the question of the purchase of sex and human trafficking were both of sufficient importance in their own right that they should not be conflated together. However, uh, although I would like to see the reduction and the eventual elimination of the purchase of sex, in the meantime, we need to do all we can to find ways to reach the women and children who are being trafficked for the sole reason of being trapped in the, the vilest way and being sold for sex. Uh, for a, a variety of reasons, the victims of the most horrendous circumstances are the ones who are in most in need to, to rescue, uh, but are the most difficult to reach. And, and I, I listened to the debate uh, so far coming uh, uh, from two sides in this, uh, and I must say that, that one of the things that I'm worried about is these very uh, victims who might, if uh, we change the system and criminalise sex, then it would be very, very difficult in my mind uh, to find. Uh, uh, it's worth noting that no matter what a uh, system is in place in the Western world, that prostitution is still in evidence. And that would suggest to me that there are women and children and men who are trapped there that we find very difficult to reach, particularly people with an ethnic background where people like me could not penetrate because of their a, 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 a particular race. So the measures proposed by the Scottish Government within this bill, such as increasing the maximum penalty of life imprisonment for offenders, send a strong message to those parasites of, of our society that we are after you. But there is another strong message which is not directed at these traffickers. traffickers. It is an acknowledgement, an acknowledgement to the victims of this crime we know that you are there and we will offer you as much support as we can. And as to my uh, closing, I would like to pay tribute to those organisations that are in the front line. Organisations such as Trafficking Awareness Raising Alliance and uh, Migrant Help play an, an invaluable role in supporting victims and encouraging uh, improving training among professionals. They are the true human face of, of to mankind their compassion and dedication to tackling this scourge in the world is an inspiration to us all. In politics, there are issues that bring out the best in politicians and political parties. This is one such area. This parliament, in one voice, sends out a strong Mr. condemnation Roger, close, of human trafficking uh, and those who profit uh, from it. Uh, and I'll close by saying I very much welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate and believe that the actions contained within the bill will go some way to helping those uh, who are in desperate need of support from society. I call on John Mason, after which to move the closing speech. No, I call on John Finney to be followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I refer to my register of interest and my membership of Amnesty and I indeed thank Amnesty and others for the preparation of um, Briefings for this debate can also congratulate Jenny Mara for her, her, her work that's led us to this point. I think this is a very welcome uh, stage that we're at. Um, the Cabinet Secretary opens the debate by uh, quoting from the policy memorandum when he says this is a serious, complicated, complex and multifaceted crime. And that's entirely the case. And uh, yet we're going to have a single offence coming out of it, which I think is very positive. But in the first of the committee's recommendations, we talk about better alignment. And the reason for that is highlighted in one of these briefings, namely that uh, the belief that deviating from excuse me, internationally accepted definitions may complicate transnational crime investigations with countries which do operate with this in, within this internationally accepted framework. So I think we need to be conscious of that. Now, uh, in 2008, Amnesty uh, undertook a, a, an inquiry called Scotland's Slaves, 
and it highlighted the prevalence of human trafficking uh, in Scotland. And they called on the Scottish Government uh, to implement the parts of the Council of Europe's Convention Against uh, Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings within its devolved powers. And I think this legislation does that. And I think also the dedicated resources we've heard that, heard that Police Scotland and the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal put into place shows, including the Special Prosecutor, that action is taking place. And this is, as many people have said, an international issue, a cross-border issue, and with much reference to the word travel, also uh, something that takes place within our borders, and I, and I hope that due consideration will be given to that by the Scottish Government. Clearly, there are challenges of detection, prosecution and support, and the issue of forced criminality when the victim becomes the accused. I uh, welcome the Cabinet Secretary's positive response to that. Another aspect that has been uh, uh, addressed is uh, consent. Uh, this is by a person held in slavery and servitude, uh, and it's not a defence for the perpetrator, and clearly the Stockholm Syndrome has applied in these instances. The issue of statutory defence, um, as has been said by many people, and probably one of the most interesting uh, parts of the evidence taken, we heard compelling arguments on both sides, and I have to say uh, that the, the committee asked the, the Cabinet Secretary to reflect. Um, Amnesty and others do seek to have that statutory defence on the face of the bill. Others have talked of the national referral mechanism, the process by which people who have been trafficked are identified, assessed and supported by the UK Government. And uh, Malcolm Chisholm indeed made uh, um, reference to that and the fact that this, this cross-border issue is often clouded by immigration and indeed in the present climate uh, against a very hostile public opinion in some instances. But um, th that term that it's clouded by immigration isn't just my personal view, it's actually the view of the Home Office who produced a, a report in November 2014 on its review of the national referral mechanism. Um, and they, they outlined some good practice, but they also highlighted um, that there was criticism of decision-making, uh, the quality and communication of decisions, and the ability to manage and share information effectively in the best interests of victims. Now, clearly, that is something that is absolutely vital if we are going to get this right. It further found concerns over the conflation of human trafficking decisions with asylum decisions. No surprise at all, given the same parties are involved on occasions, and elongated timeframes for decisions, a lack of shared responsibility, and provision of relevant information for decisions. So we have some way to go. Um, I was one of the, the committee that went on the external visits, and I'm very grateful for Bernardo's for the, the, uh, the visit that they facilitated, along with the convener and uh, Alison McInnes. Uh, we heard very graphic stories there, people travelling around, around the world, often not knowing where they are. And, and I think we forget at our peril, if we dwell too much on statistics, uh, that it is humans we're dealing with. And it's for that reason that certainly calls for the best possible psychological support. They have my support. Um, we also heard a lot about the strategy, and uh, the, the, the Cabinet Secretary used the term awareness and understanding. And I, I think there is some already there. Uh, certainly on the Equal Opportunities Committee, we heard from a, an official from Edinburgh Council about the housing, uh, housing people um, I'm often would be mo as likely to be the first point of contact for people who are the victims of trafficking rather than necessarily police officers or other officials. So there is some awareness already in this, uh, the, the system. GERFIC has been mentioned, and uh, um, again in our report we talk about there being merited, uh, they're being included uh, in, in the bill. And again, there's a very good reason why uh, children would be singled out. We know from the International Labour Organisation that children make up 26% of trafficking victims. Um, for the purposes of forced labour and sexual exploitation. And very sadly, we're told that this figure does not include trafficking for the removal of organs or for forced marriage adoption. Um, so I think that psychological support of the highest quality should be made available there. Um, and um, also in the report, we talk about more clarity being required to ensure that child victims receive appropriate and consistent support and assistance across Scotland. We did hear about causeless concerns, and, and uh, um, clearly uh, we want um, the same facilities to be available regardless of where a victim is, is found. Similarly, with guardianship, um, the, uh, there needs to be uh, options considered there, I think, um, and others certainly support that, that provision. On the presumption of age, the, the, a clause um, on, the, on the bill is, is important because we do know that we have had children incarcerated and as has been said by others there's a great difficulty actually determining an individual's age. Um, I am aware of a specific case in the Highlands where a, a, 
a young man thought he was in the outskirts of, of London, when indeed he was in the outskirts of, uh, of a Highland village, and uh, he ends up in the prison where quite clearly he, he was a victim. And back to the definitions, I think the challenge that we've talked about, about the consistency, and it's not just in this legislation, it's a recurring theme in the, uh, um, when we, we deal with the children and young people's issue, is the definition uh, that the, the Justice Committee have come up against. So any can person under close, 18... Please? I understand, yeah. Uh, so uh, in closing, can I just say that I, 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 the Independent Green Group fully support this uh, legislation and the efforts that everyone's putting in to make Scotland a place that's hostile, as has been said, to the traffickers. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on John Mason, six minutes or thereby, after which move to closing speeches. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I say that I very much support this bill and uh, all attempts to abolish or at least restrict the horrific practice of buying, selling, and transporting human beings. Slavery is a word I think we all recoil from, and we very much remember, as has been mentioned, and welcome its abolition eh, many, many years ago. Yet it does seem that variations of slavery repeatedly reemerge over the years, as some human beings in positions of power across the globe have sought to exploit and profit from their more vulnerable fellow human beings. Fundamental to all this is the equal value of every human life, and we need to constantly reassert that one person is not more valuable than another person. I very much welcome the committee's report and the range of issues it considers need, need to be looked at in more detail and possibly amended at stage two. It's good to see that the law is being updated and clarified, that there is an emphasis on support for victims and especially children, and then the whole question is raised as to whether the word child should be more specifically used eh, rather than words like youth and young. However, the main point I want to concentrate on today is whether we need to tackle demand as well as supply. That is, is this the place to consider the criminalisation of the purchase of sex, as dealt with in the committee report at paragraphs 133 to 137? Now, as has been mentioned, that is the route Northern Ireland has gone down, and I wonder if we have any real justification for not doing the same. We did have the opportunity before with Rhoda's Grants Bill, and I wonder if we're in danger of missing this opportunity for a second time. The committee seems to accept the argument of some witnesses that such a move would widen the scope of the bill too much and would deal with other matters beyond the bill's original intention. Yet I also wonder if part of the reason is that this is just such a controversial area and people would rather avoid tackling it head on. Absolutely. Christine Graham. If you'll, for, if you'll forgive me as a colleague, I think that's an unfair portrayal of the Justice Committee. Our view was that it could not be dealt with properly within this particular process. And if we had decided to do it, stage two, with a whole lot of evidence, would have had to have been extended and extended and extended. And we might not have got this bill as it stands through if it's going through. So it was a process issue, not a substance issue. John Mason. Um, I, I take uh, the convener of the Justice Committee's point. Um, I wasn't aiming any comments I was making specifically at the Justice Committee. I mean, I think perhaps the whole Parliament would rather avoid uh, dealing with this issue. But I think Rhoda Grant made the point validly that uh, we have discussed this uh, quite a lot in the past. And we do, I think, properly need to debate it in this chamber, uh, either part of this bill or somewhere else, uh, I think, fairly soon. Because in, in other areas we look at, like drugs, it, we tackle both the supply side of the equation and the demand side. We do not try and look at one on its own. Tackling the demand side is, can be done in different ways, and obviously for drugs we, we help support people and certain things are criminalised as well. So in, on this subject too, I wonder if we can look at supply alone and not take on the question of demand. A, coming from an accountancy background and having studied a little bit of economics, the two very much go hand in hand. Now, I do accept that not everyone who is trafficked is for the purpose of the sex trade, but I think we do have to accept that it is a very sizable part of the market, and Spice, I think, refers to a UN report saying it's 79%. Now, I confess I find it difficult to even talk in this way about markets, supply, demand, purchasers, sellers. How can, how can we compare a human being with some inert substance that is bought and sold? Yet, at the same time, we are talking harsh economics here, and human beings are being treated as commodities by unscrupulous traders who do only see them as commodities. So I just feel we are being somewhat naive if we think there are no parallels to other forms of trading, as with the drug trade. 
Surely we have to deal with both the demand and the supply side. And is this not the right time or the right bill? Well, if it is not, well, when is the right time and when is the right bill? This year, next year, sometime, never. I was first elected as a councillor in Glasgow some 17 years ago, and a lot of work has been done there by folk like Councillor Jim Coleman and Strathclyde Police and others on this subject. And I've attended seminars with speakers from the Nordic countries, and I have to say I became convinced that the vast majority of prostitution is abuse and exploitation of women. OK, I accept it's not always women, and I accept it may not always be abuse, but the vast majority, it seems to me, is. And I think if we are realistic, we all know that we are talking exploitation here. And if we are allowing demand for purchase of sex to be uncontrolled, we should not be surprised if criminal elements go to great lengths to meet that demand and to make a profit. Surely we have to look at the broader picture here of what is going on eh, and not think that we can solve the problem by only looking at one aspect of it. I do welcome the statement from the Cabinet Secretary, which is repeated today, that he's meeting with eh, both sides on this particular point. And I would just appeal to him and Parliament as a whole to think through this whole issue. This is a horrible, harsh topic we are speaking about today. It is not a subject that calls for a gently, gently approach. We are dealing with hardened criminals who do not care about their fellow human beings. And I believe we need to take all powers at our disposal, including criminalising the purchase of sex, if we are going to make a real impact on human trafficking. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mason. We now move to the closing speeches. Can I call Margaret Mitchell? Ms Mitchell, six minutes. Uh, Presiding officer, this is an important bill which aims to consolidate and strengthen both the existing criminal law against human trafficking and the offence relating to slavery, slavery, servitude, forced or compulsory labour and to enhance the status and support of victims. There is clearly consensus among members today that there is scope to improve and strengthen the bill at stage two. As we move forward to the next legislative stage, these new provisions should be aimed at encouraging victims of trafficking to come forward, securing the knowledge that their case will be taken seriously and handled sensitively. Victims need to know that there is adequate support available as they make the crucial and often difficult transition into a new life. It is to be hoped that, for example, a Scotland-specific panel feeding into the national referral mechanism will help to address some criticisms relating to the NRM. These include a view which some organisations express to the committee during evidence that the NRM has become a system that focuses too often um, and too much on testing credibility and data collection rather than identification and protection. Furthermore, Section 11 of the Bill, which categorises trafficking and exploitation offences as lifestyle offences, is welcome as it allows profits to be dealt with under the proceeds of crime legislation. In addition to this, the Trafficking and Exploitation Prevention and Risk Orders will allow the courts to intervene to prevent harm and deter traffickers. Whilst these measures have attracted broad support, the Law Society of Scotland has warned that a risk order may be disproportionate. Consequently, the Law Society suggests that the test should be one of significant risk before an order is imposed. But it is the issue of the possible inclusion of a provision on the criminalisation of the purchase of sex which has been the subject of the greatest divergence of opinion so far. 30% of the 55 trafficking victims identified in 2003 were linked to sexual exploitation and for this reason some organisations, especially those who support victims, sought to address this issue by making provision for criminalisation in the bill. However, whilst the participation of a great many of the individuals involved in prostitution, uh, prosti prostitution is not voluntary, I remain unconvinced that the bill is the right vehicle in which to address this issue. This is not least because, as the convener stated, the decision as to whether or not to criminalise the purchase of sex will require in-depth scrutiny of empirical evidence. To date, this has not been possible for the committee to undertake in the limited timescales involved. 
the level of uh, um, and, and therefore the level of scrutiny required um, has not been possible. Furthermore, as the committee report states, criminalisation would have implications beyond matters dealt with within this bill. Returning now to the issue of how the bill deals with children who are trafficked, more specifically, witnesses have highlighted that the bill fails to contain adequate provisions to ensure that the particular vulnerabilities of children are taken into account. Witnesses have suggested that these provisions could include the following, a specific offence of child trafficking, placing the appointment of child guardians on a statutory footing and including a presumption of age clause. The latter is particularly important as a clarification of issues surrounding the age of an, indiv an individual is deemed to be a child within the bill would be necessary to comply with the EU directive. More generally, there clearly needs to be a revaluation of the law in relation to this age issue which affects legal capacity, the age of criminal responsibility and criminal pros prosecution, medical decisions, and also the age an individual is eligible to serve on a ju jury versus serving in the army. In other words, this is an area of law which should be addressed holistically, taking into account all the various wide-ranging factors involved. Presiding officer, this bill has gained broad support across the political divide and also with third section, sector organisations, seeking as it does to end the scourge of human trafficking and forced slavery in Scotland. In addition to this, it must also ensure that protection and support for the victims does not fall short of other jurisdictions within the UK. This will be a crucial issue to address at stage two. In the meantime, the general principles of the bill are sound and will be supported by the Scottish Conservatives this evening. Thank you, Mrs Mitchell. I now call on Hugh Henry. Mr Henry, minutes. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I congratulate Jenny Mara for her tireless work in helping to frame and shape this debate over the past few years? As Alison McInnes said, the number of responses that there were to Jenny Mara's consultation indicates the level of abhorrence right across Scotland. And I also want to pay tribute to the Justice Committee because I suppose, as we would expect, the Justice Committee has produced a very thorough and thoughtful um, report which deals, I think, sensitively and appropriately with the issues that are to hand. Now, Elaine Murray pointed out that it was in 1883 that slavery was abolished in this country. And it's, it actually, it's, it's hard to imagine that what, 132 years later, there is still some form of slavery in this country. And in some respects, I think the vast majority of people in Scotland are completely blind to and ignorant of the problem that exists in our country. They don't actually realise the extent of this pernicious problem. And I think, I, I can't remember who it was, but you know, so, so, one of the speakers presiding officer in the debate pointed out that this is not the same as migrants fleeing persecution or war in their own country and simply seeking a new start in life. And Christine Graham was right to point out to the, 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 the tragic scenes that we witness in the Mediterranean. What's happening in this country is that there are criminals, evil criminals, who are exploiting human beings. And worst of all, not that exploiting women or men is, is, is any less heinous, but exploiting children also for financial gain. They are subjecting children and women to sexual abuse purely for profit. Now, there's one report that I read that suggested that the scourge of human trafficking or modern-day slavery, however you want to call it, 
is the second largest money-making crime in the world. And there is a difference between this and other forms of criminal activity because unlike a, a kilo of cocaine, a human body can be sold and used and abused over and over again. And tragically, that's the reality for some women and children in this country today, that they are being used and abused over and over again for the financial gain of a handful of people. Now, I think the Parliament is right to legislate in this. It's overdue and it's welcome. And Scottish Labour does support the provisions in the bill. That's not to say that we don't think that the bill can be improved. And, you know, there's a number of contentious issues raised um, today. That there's the issue of the purchase of sex and prostitution. Now, I actually think that the committee reached a reasonable conclusion on this. I don't think that the committee could have done anything other than reached the conclusion that it did. However, that's not to say that Parliament cannot seek to use this bill to make changes if Parliament uh, sees fit. Personally, I don't think that this is the best way to make such a fundamental change in legislation. But do you know the dilemma that I have, and I echo what Rhoda Grant said and what Joan McAlpine and John Mason has said, the problem is that if this bill is not used and I remain open-minded on it, then when will we get the opportunity to actually do something? You know, Sandra White suggested that it would be better to have a standalone bill. Well, yes, that's right. But we did try to do that. Trish Godman tried to do that uh, in the last parliament and there was no progress. Rhoda Grant has tried to do that in this parliament and failed to get cross-party support. So what exactly are we to do when faced with this problem that was so eloquently described by speakers this afternoon. Now, if I could have the guarantee that the Scottish Government is going to respond to these concerns and bring forward a standalone bill that we can act on, then that would resolve uh, the issue because I do believe it would be better dealt separately. But as long as we have this problem that has not been addressed and has not been acted upon, then I think we leave ourselves open to people, quite rightly, seeking to use this as a vehicle, although it is a separate issue, and as speaker after speaker has pointed out, in some senses, the two should not be uh, conflated. The issue of statutory defence and instructions, again, um, you know, is a thorny one. You know, as Christine Graham pointed out, you know, there is a dilemma when you hear the Lord Advocate on the one hand and a representative of the Faculty of Advocates on the other hand uh, giving totally uh, different uh, evidence. What does the humble committee do in those circumstances? Um, and I do wonder whether it's something that we could return to at stage two um, to have some further consideration about whether, as, uh, as a number of speakers have suggested, you could have both the statutory uh, approach and also in instructions. Um, there are, you know, the minds, the legal minds that uh, have been trained in this are far better than mine. So I, I would hesitate to, to draw a conclusion at this stage, but I do think that it's worthy of further consideration. The issue of guardianship has come up, and I think uh, we do need to ponder on, on that one. I, I don't want to reopen the debate in, in, in this bill about the adequacy of named person legislation. But you know, when we are talking about young people who have been abused in the way that these young people are being abused, I do wonder whether the named person approach, uh, Cabinet Secretary, is actually the best way to take this forward. We are not just talking about the run-of-the-mill child where there is a concern where the, the, the named person 
can intervene. This is about real horrid criminal activity and, and perhaps you do need, uh, sorry I don't have time, uh, I think perhaps you do need um, to, to refocus and reconsider that. So we welcome this bill, we welcome the increase in sentencing. I do think that perhaps we need to just be careful that on support and assistance, presiding officer, we don't impose a burden on councils uh, without giving them uh, the adequate support. And, and, and to finish, you know, I'll, I'll just leave Parliament you know, with, with this thought, that there are more women in Scotland currently in prison for offences committed as a result of their traffic situation than there are people convicted of human trafficking-related offences. The balance in this country is wrong, and that's why we need this bill. Thank you, Mr Henry. I now call on Michael Matheson to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, till 4.59. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And can I begin by thanking all members for their contributions in the uh, debate here this afternoon? There's been a number of um, uh, very detailed contribu uh, con contributions uh, by a number of members who have been involved in the whole issue of tackling human trafficking and exploitation over a number of uh, years now. And I've listened with great care to uh, the views and the concerns which have been expressed by uh, members. I should uh, say that I will try to cover as many of the issues as I can in the course of the time which I have, but my apologies to those who uh, may have raised uh, particular points that, I've, uh, that I don't get the chance to uh, cover. I want to turn to what I think is Hugh Henry has uh, characterised as being the, the thorn issue of the, uh, uh, this, the, the proposal for a statutory uh, defence, uh, an issue which was obviously considered by uh, the committee. And I'm mindful of the views that uh, members have expressed here today, with uh, some of them sympathetic to it, but not persuaded that there should be a statutory offence uh, on the face of the bill in light of the evidence which was received by, uh, uh, by, uh, from the Lord Advocate. What I want to reassure members of is that uh, the approach that we have taken is a deliberate one because we did consider the whole issue of a statutory offence being defence being put on the place on the face of the bill. And we chose not to, for the very specific reasons that I outlined to the committee, is that we have chosen to take a much more victim centred approach, which allows us to intervene at a much earlier stage and gives the Lord Advocate and the Crown the flexibility to act on that at an early stage. Now, I know that some members have suggested that what we should then do is that we should have what would be uh, is the uh, Lord Advocate's guidelines, which um, he's indicated he's prepared to take to instructions, which we're more than uh, content to bring forward a, an amendment stage to, uh, to make provision for. But that you could have both of them in the legislation at the same time. But as the Lord Advocate has also pointed out, that if you have a statutory defence alongside instructions, then the instructions that he then publishes would actually be governed and influenced by the statutory defence itself. It would have a direct impact on them. The other potential consequence is, is that defence agents then start to become dependent upon what will be the statutory defence approach which undermines the victim-centred approach that we are trying to achieve, and that is identification at an early stage and intervening at an early stage through the use of the guidelines or the instructions, which if, if defence agents then feel that they are just going to use a statutory defence, will mean that they are then less likely to flag up to prosecutors that they may have concerns that this individual may have been trafficked. So this is not something that wasn't considered in great detail in the drafting of this bill, but it's been considered as a way in which we can actually give greater focus on the needs of victims. And that's why we're not persuaded that there should be a statutory defence put on the face of the bill itself. But no doubt, I suspect this is an issue which we will return to at stage two in committee, and I suspect possibly at stage three as well, at presiding officer. Can I turn to another issue that several members have raised in the course of this debate, and that is our issue around the presumption of age. This is a, a very challenging and difficult area as well, because the likelihood for many of those, particularly younger people who have been trafficked, is that many of them may have come from areas where, and jurisdictions where they have no papers, and we have no way of identifying what particular age they may actually uh, be. And as it stands at the present time, 
uh, within local authorities and social work provision, if they identify a vulnerable person and they, even if they don't have papers, they think they are a child or a young person, then the approach they should take is in dealing with them as a child or a young person uh, until they know otherwise, because finalising someone's age and identifying, and, and identifying their age can take several weeks or months to be able to achieve that uh, and to come to a confirmed position on it. So the approach that we have taken is one which is to try and avoid that potential problem of those individuals who don't have papers that may appear to be a child but are not a child ending up getting put into child services or the other way around. But I do recognise some of the concerns that members have raised and we are looking again at whether we should make provision uh, within uh, the bill in order to try and address this. It's a point which the Lord Advocate has raised as well. So we are going to consider whether we should amend the bill at stage two in order to have uh, a statutory presumption of age in order to address some of these issues and concerns. Can I turn as well to, uh, sign officer, to the issue of the term uh, travel uh, and the approach which we have uh, taken in this. I think it's important to emphasise that the offence within this bill does not criminalise travel, but rather it actually criminalises a specific act of recruitment, transfer or transportation of a person, transfer or exchange of a person, and harbouring or receipt of a person uh, that constitutes arranging or facilitating uh, travel. Now, these are acts, these uh, are, are all part of what was set out within the EU directive. And also, the approach that we've taken uh, around the definition of the offence, including the term travel, is the same as has been taken forward in England and Wales and Northern Ireland. They're virtually the same. And it's been provided in such a way in order to make sure that we have a distinction between that of human trafficking and exploitation. Uh, and that's why travelling is an important element of it. But as I may, made the point in my opening comments, that's not about travelling from uh, one country to the next. It is for travelling within uh, the UK itself. But what we are going to do is look to see whether we can further amend it at stage two in order to provide some further certainty and clarity around this uh, matter, given the concerns which have been uh, raised. I want to turn to the issue of guardianship that Jenny Mara raised and a few other members have raised in the course of this debate um, as well. I think it goes without saying. We all have an interest in trying to do the right thing for any child or young person who finds themselves being trafficked. And it's trying to make sure that we find a mechanism and way in which we can achieve that most effectively. And the approach that we have taken in the bill has sought to achieve that. We have a range of pieces of legislation in place which apply to children and young people and the statutory responsibility that a range of agencies have when a young person or a child is being identified as being vulnerable, as would be the case for any child or young person who is being trafficked, that those provisions would then automatically start to be uh, provided. But I do also recognise some of the concerns that have been raised by uh, members in the chamber here today about some of the concerns about the issue of uh, having appropriate uh, guardianship for uh, children in these particular circumstances. And although the approach I set out is our favoured approach at this particular point, and also the measures that we will take forward within the strategy, we are going to look at where there are further mechanisms and provisions that we can make in order to address some of the issues of concern that have been raised at the stage one uh, process. And that will include the possibility of statutory provisions that can address some of these concerns as well. Can I turn uh, to several other points, presiding officer, uh, that have been raised in the course of this debate? There's absolutely no doubt that one of the most important elements of taking forward this legislation is not just the creation of a, an offence in itself, but it's also looking at the whole range of other measures that we have to take to help to support and assist those who have found themselves being humanly trafficked or being exploited. And the support and assistance that they require, which is strategy, will be central to helping to uh, deliver. But I am also mindful of the concerns that have been raised about some of the provisions in the bill. It was raised by Alison McInnes around the uh, provision around uh, counselling the uh, list that's been provided within the bill. I should reassure members that the list that's in there uh, for support and assistance is not uh, uh, exhaustive. Uh, it does actually go beyond that in itself. It's not exclusive that that's all that can actually be uh, provided. But we are going to look at amending the bill at stage two to change the term counselling to psychological assessment and treatment in order to address some of the issues that have been raised. So, in, in uh, the closing uh, uh, 
in the, in the few moments I have left, can I just say that I'm very conscious that the issue of the uh, criminalisation for the purchase of sex is an issue uh, that is complex and that there are strong views held on this, which were put by Rhoda Grant, by John McAlpine and also by uh, John Mason, and also the concerns that members have about the potential for putting something like this in this particular bill. I set out right at the very start and said I would meet with those who have a view on this matter from both sides of it. I have already met with half of those who are in support of it. I will be meeting with those who oppose any provision uh, within this bill. I do believe a substantive issue has been raised here that has to be considered, but I am also mindful of the view of the committee that they do not believe that this bill is the right vehicle uh, to do that. But what I can assure uh, the committee and the Parliament is by the time that I arrive at the stage two process uh, in the committee in considering this issue, I will be able to set out what the view of the government is in this particular matter, having met with both groups uh, who have a view on this matter. So, you know, sir, I believe this is a bill that has got broad support across this chamber that will make Scotland a hostile place for those who want to indulge in human trafficking and human exploitation, to make Scotland a place where they cannot do business. And they can be assured the approach this government will take forward in the stage two and stage three process will be to build on this bill to make sure that Scotland is that hostile place for those who peddle in this type of crime. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 12553 in the name of John Swinney, financial resolution on the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill. I call on John Swinney to move the motion. Uh, form the move, President. Officer. Question. This motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 13122 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revised business programme for tomorrow, Wednesday the 13th May. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13122. Moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put this question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 13122, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is decision time. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number 13107, in the name of Michael Matheson, on the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12553, in the name of John Swinney, on the financial resolution for the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.